Um, because I've got a little COVID announcement you guys have all been dying to hear. So the PSE meeting um, for December 8th is now in order. And in keeping with the Oregon public meeting law, statutory land use hearing requirements and Title 33 of the Portland City Code, the Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission is holding this meeting virtually. All members of the PSE are attending remotely and the city has made several avenues available for the public to watch the broadcast of this meeting. The PSE is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and promote social distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety, and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all for your patience, humor, flexibility, and understanding as we manage through this difficult situation to do the city's business. And with that, I will see if there's any commissioners who have an item of interest to share. I am not seeing any, so I will hand the baton to Director Durbin, and if she's here, or um, I see Joe is on the line. Would you like to step in, Joe, or should we? Um, we can switch the order around a little bit and go to consent. Oh, Andrea. Oh, Andrea is here. Fantastic. Apologies, everyone. I was on, a, on another call. Um, great to see you all. Thank you for uh, the time. A couple of quick updates, actually. Wanted to update everyone on the uh, recruitment process for Planning Sustainability um, Commission members. Recruitment closed November 20th. We have um, had 55 candidates, great um, um, batch of candidates, and we're doing interviews, first round of interviews this month. Um, the goal is to make recommendations um, for the mayor and the mayor will meet uh, the candidates and, and narrow it down to four, uh, a selection of four candidates, um, some who will start earlier and some later um, next year. So we hope to have that, um, to be able to welcome new uh, members of the commission in uh, January once we go through that process. And wanna thank um, Commissioner Borchalazzo for his participation in the interview process in the committee. Um, and then I just wanted to um, remind folks that Commissioners, that uh, as, as you reach out to, um, as we're working on different um, legislative packages, it's important to stay in communication with us if you want to talk with um, any uh, member of city council and make sure that we are informed about that and we can help coordinate that communication. We're, um, we work very closely with council and if there's specific questions that commission members want to have answered, we'll happy to have those answered. Um, just wanted to um, make a friendly offering and reminder for commissioners about that. And that's actually it. Don't have too much to update everyone on today. Eli, you're on mute. I got it all. Thank you. Um, when I think when each of one of us was um, appointed to the commission, the mayor had this bureau. Um, now that someone else has a bureau, does that change the appointment or is it still the mayor doing it independent of who's got bureau it is? It's still the mayor doing it. Um, as everyone knows, the bureau assignments will be made into this year, early early January, and then um, we'll certainly want to coordinate. If we have a, com a commissioner in charge rather than the mayor, we'll certainly want to uh, coordinate with the commissioner as well. Okay, thank you very so much. I, can I just jump in, Eli? If your question is about um, appointing people to the PSC, it's always a mural recommendation to city council and city council will confirm that. That is what I was asking, perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, all right, um, for the consent agenda, um, all we have is the minutes from the last meeting. Would someone like to make a motion to approve them? Move adoption. Thank you, Chris. A second? Second. Second from Jeff. Everyone, raise your hand if you support adopting the minutes from last meeting. And I can see um, seven hands, including mine, but I think the other ones might be supporting also Oh, there we go, Kat. It's a chance to see our fellow commissioners. Thank you. Kat <laughs> approves unanimous, proved unanimously. Thank you. Um, our next agenda item is the E-Zone map correction project. And we're not going to spend much time on that today because here's what I'm going to tell you. While it was originally slated for this December 8, 2020 meeting, we are continuing the E-Zone map correction project hearing to February 23rd, 2021 at 5 p.m. More details will follow and oral testimony will be taken on February 23rd. So there will be additional chance for oral testimony and we have to say this in order to continue it so we don't lose our track on this project. Chair, am yes. I? Yeah. Uh, real quick, um, 
just wanted to give you a heads up. I'm having bandwidth issues, so I'm going to try to keep my video off to see if that helps. Um, and it also means that during testimony, Steph, I may not be able to help you because I keep freezing up. Steph has um, given me the, the lowdown on how to do oh. my role and summarize your role also, but if you can't do it, I will do my best to step in. I forgot that's right. You guys were switching. So yeah, just as a heads up, um, if you're, so keep an eye on that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I'll text you if you have any trouble and you can text us if you want to raise your hand and you can't, we can't see you. Thanks. Great. Um, all right, our, um, as some of you know, our bylaws call for the chair to preside over all PSC meetings unless the chair is not in attendance, um, in which case the vice chair um, can chair the, the, that particular segment. And about a year ago, I made the pitch that I'd love to pass the baton more um, than that might suggest. And with COVID, I've not had to miss meetings because it's easy to show up wherever I am. So I just wanted to say that um, our bylaws don't anticipate this, but we have made arrangements so that um, Steph can um, take the lead um, on the shelter to housing project. Um, and since our bylaws don't address it cleanly, I'd like to get a hopefully unanimous consent for um, Steph to chair the um, each stage of the process through this project. So that would start off with the public hearings we're having today and in a week from now, and we'll continue on to our deliberations and our recommendation. So I'd like to see if someone would like to make that, oh, I will make that motion um, that, and I will be on the line some of the time, probably all of it, but um, can I have a second for that? Second. I got a second from Chris and Katie. Um, Chris, you gotta do the minutes. So Katie, you got that one. And if everyone would like to, would like to support this, raise your hand, real or virtual. Seeing everybody, I think that is unanimous. So with unanimous agreement, Steph will be um, chairing the shelter to housing project as it goes to the PSC. And I'm absolutely interested in talking with other people about doing this down the road. Cause I think as a long-term, it takes practice to do this work. And as long-term leadership development, whether it's leadership of the PSC or other venues, it's good to um, try doing try doing this kind of stuff. So with that, I'm gonna um, hand the baton over to Steph. Welcome. And I will be doing the best support I can to the public testimony. Thanks. Thank you all. And um, I, I hope I got out most of my yayas uh, over stress dreams over the last week. Uh, so first, uh, if we could start uh, shelter to housing continuum. Um, just wanted before we call, uh, Eric and Al up uh, for um, the opening presentation. Um, are there any disclosures that anyone wishes to make? Eli? I do have one disclosure. I own two tiny homes. Um, for a long time, they were at the Caravan Tiny House Hotel. Now, one of them is in Southeast Portland and one of them is in Corbett. So that's my disclosure. I don't see this presents a conflict of interest. Thanks. Great, Thank you. anyone else? Dennis? Okay, lovely. Um, Eric Engstrom and Al Burns, can we invite you to the floor? Sure, thank you. Um, thank you. I'll kick it off here. Um, so the, the purpose of this project is to provide more opportunities for um, houselessness, um, to move people from houselessness to supportive shelter and more opportunities to transition from shelter into permanent housing. Um, uh, we're doing this by amending several city codes to facilitate the work of agencies and nonprofits that provide shelter and housing and related supportive services uh, and for uh, builders of market rate affordable housing. Uh, there are four areas of, of changes in this project. Um, the first area is to facilitate uh, the temporary and permanent siting of shelters and related services. Um, the second area is to establish a new type of outdoor shelter in the zoning code that would be a community service use. The third area is to provide uh, more opportunities for group living uses uh, in, in a variety of zones. Uh, and the fourth is to, to allow um, uh, limited residential occupancy of, of tiny houses on wheels or an RV on uh, private property. Um, so those are the four basic groups of, of issues you're going to hear about today and um, we're going to try and keep our intro very very short so um, Al Burns is here with me and he will say a few words he's been the project manager for this project 
Um, Jesse Connor from the Housing Bureau is here, uh, and she will talk briefly about the, the Housing Bureau's interest in this. Um, and April uh, uh, Roman from the Joint Office is also here, and she'll talk about their perspective. So I'll turn it over to Al, and then he will turn it over to, to Jesse and April. So Al, take it away. Thank you. Um, the um, first wanted to frame the project. It's a little unusual project coming to the PSC because it, uh, we're proposing changes to more than just Title 33 planning and zoning. We tiptoed through all, all the city code looking for existing code impediments that might frustrate the work of our existing partners as they provide shelter or affordable housing. So uh, yes, as always, we'll be looking for a recommendation from the PSC on the Title 33 changes, and uh, I suppose suggestions on the other code changes, and perhaps the most elegant way to present that would be uh, through the Commission's transmittal uh, letter to Council. Um, the, um, when, when this goes to Council, it will be adopted in two parts by two ordinances, one for the Title 33 part and the other for the non-Title 3 code changes. I um, want to emphasize, like Eric did, that the most important word in the entire project is continuum. This is a project of, uh, that establishes more front doors so people can enter our sheltering system, but that's always a view toward transitioning to housing because the goal is to find every port in Portland or a safe and decent place to live per permanently. And uh, this project's not really about the Planning Bureau, it's about the work of our partner agencies and community and nonprofit agencies. And so because of that, I, we've invited a couple of our partners. We have Jesse Connor from the Portland Housing Bureau and April Roman from the Joint Office on Homelessness Services. And we've invited them to speak for a minute or two about how these code changes are articulate with the work they do. Let's see, Jesse, would you go first, please? Sure. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Jesse Connor here. I'm the Senior Policy and Planning Coordinator at the Portland Housing Bureau. Uh, I use she, her, um, or they pronouns. Um, so the Sheltered Housing Continuum Project is really a great opportunity to support a variety of regulated affordable housing types, um, including the multi, multiple faces um, of the single room occupancy or the, or the SRO uh, type. Um, the Housing Bureau is glad to have had an opportunity to participate um, in the proposal development. Um, for the last year or so, I've participated on the technical advisory group um, led by BPS. Um, I appreciate uh, the level of engagement and voice that BPS has extended to the Housing Bureau, you know, regarding the code changes that are really have that particular impact to that sort of world of, of SROs and group living. Um, they've been receptive to our feedback um, and, you know, really, really a willing uh, partner here in, in compromise and, and finding the best solutions. Uh, the collaboration also uh, with, with some of our partner agencies, you know, the joint office, um, you know, their guidance on regulatory versus programmatic needs um, in, the, in the houseless and shelter space has really been essential uh, from, from the Housing Bureau's perspective, um, as well as um, just the enormous um, um, gratitude for the Bureau of Development Services technical expertise um, on, the, on the technical advisory group, which I would be a bit lost um, without uh, sometimes, so I appreciate Appreciate that. Um, I'll be here uh, throughout the you know hearings um, through your work sessions. If you happen to have any questions for the Housing Bureau, thanks, April. Hey everyone, my name is April Roman. I am the Emergency Shelter and Services Coordinator from the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Pronouns are they or she. Um, I'd like to also extend Jesse's. Uh, uh, gratitude to the team that has put to work um, on all of the things that have been proposed to you here, all these changes that are needed, and just extend on, on sort of why this is important, which um, is not a stretch for us all to see. But, you know, since 2015, the Joint Office not only has doubled the number of publicly funded shelter beds in our community, but more importantly, we've created spaces that are more accessible they're more accessible to families and couples, gender non-conforming folks and our pets. They're more housing focused. 
We have built in services for housing placement as a standard now in all of our operations. These are purpose built and design spaces that need to be preserved as we continue to develop and improve after the state of emergency lifts. These spaces offer hope and a sense of worth to the people that live within our communities and these spaces that are designed intentionally to be within the communities from which people are living now. These ultimately uh, are a beacon of success when we're able to see communities wrap around these spaces in different efforts to help people connect to the community and maintain that connection to the community, which is a vital part of someone's transition to housing. So ultimately, shelter is not the solution to homelessness, and it is a stepping point to maintaining their connection to the community. And with these code changes, we'll be able to preserve those efforts. And I wanted to thank you all for your time. And I'll also be around if you have any questions about the joint office uh, uh, programs or strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, Al, Jesse, and April. Um, with that, um, we'll, we're about to go to testimony. Um, but before that, if we could, because uh, it's, it's good to know, um, I think when, when people are testifying, who the commissioners are. So um, maybe we could do uh, brief introductions. I'm Steph Routh, she, her, uh, and I am uh, vice chair. I will kick it to Eli. I'm Eli Spivak, chair of the PSC. I'm a developer general contractor and work with um, co-housing communities and um, tiny homes and some stuff locally, some stuff around the country. Thanks. I'll kick it the mic. Uh, Mike Houck. I've been on the commission uh, going on a little over 11 years. I'm particularly interested in urban nature, uh, green infrastructure issues related to sustainability, among many other issues we deal with. Chris. Hi, Chris Smith, uh, probably best known as a transportation activist and my, uh, my day job uh, is in technology. And I will kick it to Katie. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Katie Larcell, I've been on the commission for two, three, four years, something like that. And um, I am a member of the East Portland Action Plan and pay particular attention to East Portland issues. So let's see, Ben, have you checked in? Thanks, Katie. Uh, ben Bortolazzo, been at the commission for about three years. Um, and my day job is as an urban designer and architect, uh, primarily focusing on designing or retrofitting communities. And I'll kick it over to Kat. Hi, Kat Schultz. Uh, I'm an architect and vice chair of the commission. And Jeff, why don't you go ahead and tell us about yourself? Thank you, Katie. Uh, Kat, Kat. I'm Jeff Backrack. I think I'm on about five, six years on the planning commission. My day job is a lawyer. And if I had a special interest, it would be in all housing issues, affordable housing in particular. I did serve 10 years on what used to be known as the Housing Authority of Portland and is now home forward. Thanks. Uh, Oriana. Thanks, Jeff. My name is Oriana Maniera. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I've been on the commission for about a year and a half. And in my day job, I'm energy, climate, and transportation manager at a community based organization in the Cully neighborhood called Verde. I also sit on the state global warming commission and really excited to have everybody testifying today and engaging on an issue that is near and dear to my heart. And I think I was the last one. Uh, Steph, kick it to the next person if I have forgotten. Oh no, Eli. Oh, Eli, has, has he? Eli has, Eli went second. Thank you, we have, uh, we have all introduced ourselves. Thank you all so much. And so now we're, we're going to testimony. Um, I'd like to, uh, Echo Oriana's, thank you all for taking the time uh, to be here um, under you know, the strange COVID virtual circumstances. Um, we will be bringing just the process. Uh, uh, Eli will be moving you over in, as a panelist right before your name is up uh, uh, when you're called. And if you, um, and then you'll have two minutes. I will just do this when you have 30 seconds left. Um, 
and then uh, kind of occasionally say thank you, thank you, uh, after the two minutes are up. So um, could we first have uh, Tim McCormick, Leon Porter, and Isha Lino? And forgive me if I have mispronounced any names. Uh, Tim, can we hear from you? Tim, are you able to speak? Um, uh, could someone make me co-host? Just. Yeah, he's got his hand up. I've given him a yeah. to speak. Maybe we need more than that. Maybe we should go to see if Isha has any luck. This is Isha, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, please go. Okay, thanks. So this is my three minutes into two minutes. I thought we had three minutes. So my name's Isha Lean. I wanna thank you all for your great work on the shelter to housing continuum. Uh, my testimony is around easing restrictions on RVs, tiny houses and mobile dwellings on residential properties. I believe I can offer a unique perspective as I've lived in three tiny houses over the last five years, uh, one that I rented, one owned by a former partner and one that I built and reside in today. That's where I'm testifying from. Um, I've lived in two different tiny house communities, one of which I founded that's still in existence uh, in, on the property with a single family home here in Portland. So utilizing mobile dwellings has a lot of benefits. It's allowed me to build First is I'd like to uh, request allowing more than one RV or a tiny house per property. This will increase flexibility and support Portland's goal of providing more legal housing. Second, um, I'd like to ask not to require RVs be built to a standard with certification and inspection. As you probably know, the state of Oregon building codes already eliminated the requirement and we'd like to ask Portland do the same. This will reduce complexity and expense to build. Um, it's often financially prohibitive and functionally unnecessary to bring existing tiny houses on wheels up to an ANSI or NFPA standard. And a lot of these homes were built before um, that code was put into place. So I think the eliminating the standard will increase flexibility and optionality. Um, third, I don't think it makes sense to classify RVs as ADUs. Um, there, so just eliminating that uh, requirement will allow for more flexibility. And then finally, don't require RV hookups. In many cases, they're unnecessary and um, could be done with a bunch of uh, flexible options. And I'll put it in written testimony what we need on there. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Tim, can we hear from you? Okay, Tim, we'll keep trying. Um, uh, Leon? Hi, can you, hear, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, I'm Leon Porter. I strongly support the proposed draft of the Sheltered Housing Continuum Project, and I really appreciate the improvements the BPS staff made in response to our feedback on the discussion draft. Um, I also support uh, what uh, Isha Lena just said, and um, I'd like to propose a few more changes to help the project address the houselessness crisis even more effectively. First, please allow group living by right in all residential structures in single family neighborhoods. In the proposed draft, group living is now defined as including any residential occupancy of a home with over six bedrooms, which technically means even occupancy by one resident. But the proposed draft makes group living a conditional use in homes of over 3,500 square feet. 
that implies that all homes over 3,500 square feet with more than six bedrooms technically would have to remain completely vacant until they went under until they underwent conditional use review. And that restriction would apply even to homes built decades ago. Now, I'm sure this is an unintended consequence, but you can easily fix it by just allowing group living by right wherever household living is allowed by right, or better, by simply merging group living and household living into a single category. Also, please relax the conditional use requirements for both mass shelters and outdoor shelters and substantially increase the number of beds or accommodations allowed per shelter. Portland Neighbors Welcome will submit written testimony with more specific requests. But for now, I'd just like to point out that you've received plenty of written testimony in favor of making changes like these and very little opposing testimony at all from anyone who's actually read the proposal. Thank so, you. Oh, you can finish out. up. What? Finish up. Okay, uh, that's your cue from the people of Portland that this is no time for cautious incrementalism. We're facing an extreme homelessness crisis that everyone's desperate to solve and just raising the number of allowed beds per shelter from 20 to 25 is not gonna cut it. Uh, we really need to at least double the allowances to make a significant impact. That's all. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Leon. Tim, third time's the charm. We can see you. We're halfway there. Okay. We'll go to the next few, um, but we'll keep coming back. Hope Springs Eternal. Um, can we now have CJ Alessandro? Hi there, uh, my name is CJ Alessandro. I am a social worker working in one of our larger nonprofit mental health agencies in Portland. I use they and he pronouns. Um, I guess I don't have any proposed changes. I guess I'll second what Isha and Leon have said. Um, my main point was to just talk about how it impacts the people that I work with, uh, which is people who have severe and persistent mental illness, uh, typically uh, schizophrenia. And I will tell you that housing is the number one solution that I propose to people. Um, for most of the issues people are coming to me with in the community these days, people are, I don't know if people are familiar with what's going on today at the um, the Red House on Mississippi, um, but I, I invite people to Google or to go to redhouseonmississippi.com and, uh, and see what's happening with the forcible removal of people there today. But um, yes, the, the people that I work with are the people who end up on the streets. And I've had, um, I had one resident uh, die of hypothermia and uh, probably substance use because they're unable to find shelter. Um, I have one person who their plan is to leave my secured uh, lock facility and go into an SRO motel, um, which doesn't exist anymore because uh, they keep bringing up the Joyce, the Stewart, the, all these places that are closed. Um, so I guess I want to say I strongly support the uh, shelter to housing continuum. I really appreciate what April said. It is a stepping point, not a solution. Um, I think my solution would be you know, safe private housing for everyone with basic income, et cetera. But we'll start here. Um, I think that providing these very light um, code changes will, will re reduce uh, crimes of poverty, you know, trespassing, petty larceny, all the things that we are seeing that people do when they survive outside. I think we'll see reduce in deaths from suicide, from mental health related issues, from hypothermia. Um, and I'm just, I'm really jazzed about this. I think I'm coming up to my two minute mark. So just thank you for having me here um, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, let us try Tim again. Nope. Nope. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no. uh, we will keep trying. Uh, let us know. Um, uh, let us next go to Sean Green.
Thank you. My name is Sean Green. I'm chair of the Northeast Coalition of Neighborhoods and have been involved in a few organizations that have been advocating for our unhoused neighbors. We plan to revise the letter we submitted for the discussion draft. I wanted to take this opportunity to discuss the process and reflect on the need for a true continuum of options to better our community. The timeline for this project is being driven by the expiration of the Portland's housing state of emergency. The state of emergency has allowed us zoning code flexibility. This zoning code project feels rushed compared to many other zoning code projects for which I've been involved in the past. I support the general areas of changes found within the project, but I feel like we need more time to get this right. Given your position on the Planning and Sustainability Commission, I feel you are well positioned to engage the council to consider if there is an opportunity to extend the length of this project and the housing emergency. I am focused on the outdoor shelter provisions as part of this project. If these provisions are implemented as proposed, our options to support our unhoused neighbors would be more limited than they are today and limited to only certain parts of our city. And the process to create outdoor shelters as proposed adds cost, complexity, and time. We just went through the expanding opportunities for affordable housing project, which as one of its primary goals was to make it easier to create affordable housing. We did this by eliminating the conditional use requirement. The current proposed draft requires conditional use permits for all outdoor shelters that operate more than 180 days and is required uh, in many zones um, uh, that don't have the ability to operate before a conditional use permit. I hope we're able to get this right, uh, given the importance of this for our community and our Hunter House neighbors. Um, and I hope we consider as a community extending this project and the housing emergency in addition to the many changes many of us have been proposing. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, we have a call-in number and it's one of three people. <laughs> and I'm not sure which, if anyone has any insights as to uh, which order uh, I would delight in knowing. Uh, in the interim, uh, let us go to Tony Diethel. Welcome, Tony. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, hi, my name is Tony Diethel. Um, everybody gets it wrong, don't worry. Um, um, so, uh, I have built a tiny house. I have lived in a tiny house. I helped a lot of people build tiny houses. Um, one of them was Isha. Um, and I started a tiny house community in Portland in the Coley neighborhood um, that has been going for about six years now or so. Um, we have four tiny houses in the backyard um, and, and a single and a house. Um, <clears throat> so I would like to say that, um, so my first thing, um, requiring RV hookups is cost prohibitive. It was expensive to put water and electrical lines into the backyard. And we did it and we went through the permitting process, but it was expensive. Sewer is really, really much more expensive and hard to do. Um, and in many cases, it's not needed. A lot of times tiny houses function as an external bedroom. Um, people can come into the big house to use facilities and, and do. Um, so it's not really always needed. Um, I welcome RV hookups if it's required, but if it's not, why make people go through the expense? Um, another thing um, is there was a, in, in the draft proposal um, to count them as ADUs. Um, there's a certain number of ADUs that you can have. I would be violating it right now just by existing. Um, many places have bigger lots and so can, can support more than one tiny house. Um, churches especially, stuff like that. So please don't, it's not an ADU and it doesn't increase the tax of the, the property. Um, I'll end by saying um, nobody wants shanty towns and we need some regulatory process around this to make sure we don't get that, yes. Um, but it needs to be easy to do for people who are DIYing and want to make this work and make it easy to do. Um, also, I'll extend an invitation. Um, I think we've done this right and we've existed for a long time. If anybody wants a tour, uh, come visit us. We'll answer all your questions. All right. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, next, Barbara Weber, Weber, followed by Doug Klotz. It is Weber. Thank Hello. you. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not particularly familiar with all the ins and outs of this particular, I mean, I, I'm on the central east side together board. 
Um, so I know a little bit about the new zoning. Uh, but my concern is, and I live in a tiny home right now, which is Hazelnut Grove. And it's been there, the village has been there approximately five years. Um, and what we really need to help with the housing, with the homeless situation is more tiny villages, tiny home villages. Uh, affordable housing is like a long ways away and it doesn't fit everyone. Everyone has a particular different set of circumstances. And um, I think it's a mistake to, to just make all of these trans, all of these villages transitional. Um, I, I think we need to have a, a gamut of options to figure out what people need uh, because everyone is coming with a different set of circumstances. Thank you. It's going to be brief. Thanks. Thank you very much, Barbara. Jonathan? And then we will try again with Tim. Doug, can we hear from you? Yes. Hi, uh, Acting Chair Routh, Chair Spivak and Commissioners. Um, this is a much needed set of changes to the zoning code uh, to provide help for those currently houseless as well as those who could lose their home housing in the future. Um, several of the commenters that did comment worried about livability, but allowing these additional living arrangements could decrease the number of people living on the streets and improve livability for everyone. This project adds a dozen more options to house all who want it. I support these changes, uh, including allowing congregate housing in all single dwelling zones, allowing group living by right in all single dwelling zones, eliminating zoning restrictions on temporary shelters that are up to 180, 180 days and maybe longer, um, removing the prohibitions on kitchen facilities in sleeping rooms and congregate facilities, and also remove the requirement for a kitchen on every floor. Uh, I don't have that in my house, uh, increasing the number of beds by right in short-term shelters from 20 to 40 and in outdoor shelters from 20 to 60 in the allowed zones and increase the number of beds allowed by right in mass shelters from 20 to 40. I support the tiny house changes that Cole Peterson and also Shelter PDX suggest, um, like not counting the tiny house toward the ADU allowance and by allowing more than one tiny house, house per lot. Finally, I ask you to allow group living by right in existing residential structures of any size and relax the conditional use review requirements for shelters. I also support the recommendations of Portland Neighbors Welcome, which will be submitted soon. I'm glad the city is adding more options to help reduce our growing percentage of houseless people. Please support this draft with the suggested changes. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Before we go um, to Cole, could we try Tim again? Tim, are you? Can you hear me now? <gasps> yes! Sorry, yes. yes. That, that is the best welcome I've ever received <laughs> in my life. Um, uh, thank you, commissioners, for having me. Uh, Steph, Eli. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm hearing an echo. I don't know if you are, but I'll try and talk through it. Um, my name is Tim McCormick. I'm lead organizer of PDX Shelter Forum. Um, trying to get this phone off. And also working on Shelter PDX Coalition. Um, along with others you'll hear from today. Uh, as context, I'd like to note that I've lived for many years cumulatively in self-built mobile or large shared dwelling situations, often on extremely low income and often paying little to no rent. So I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at how to do that and how city rules can help or harm that and how others navigate that. And also when I look at this today, uh, these, this proposal, I look at it from the standpoint of this may be how I and friends will be able to keep living in Portland even this coming year. In other words, it is unclear to me whether I will still be able to live here this year. And this is 50 years after my family came to Portland. Um, in the written testimony I and partners will be submitting, I'll get into various specific suggestions, but to start, uh, I'd like to foreground that we have a major public emergency here and also a, a chronic corrosive failure of justice and failure of our housing system. So I believe we should be asking, are we doing all we can reasonably do as a city to rise to this challenge 
or are we shrinking before our fears and practices? And we should ask, what would we be proposed here if houseless people, the most affected, had run this? And I believe that while this proposal takes us forward, it still sharply limits the city's ability to tackle issues, for example, by proposing to take away the state of emergency um, declaration ability. We can change long-term code without taking that away. Um, and, then, and then finally, I'd like to say, we should ask how we can use all city resources, including land, to bring to this problem. And so I'd like to propose that at least some outdoor spaces, appropriate ones be considered, and also public right of way by licensing and managing vehicle dwelling on, on a public right of way through a pilot license program. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tim. You get our Perseverance Award for the day. Um, let us go to Cole Peterson um, and then Russell, uh, Russell Hufflish. Thank you. Um, and I'll just begin by saying if there's any way I can share my screen, I've prepared a little presentation I'd love to show, but if not, I'll just talk. Uh, my name is Cole Peterson. I own the Tiny House Hotel. Um, and I also built an um, infrastructure for a tiny house on wheels on a residential property. All, both, both circumstances I did so with, with permits. Um, and so I just, I just mostly want to start by saying I'm so happy that this issue is um, now being uh, taken up officially um, by the city of Portland um, as a viable housing strategy. Um, it was considered back in um, are not considered under the accessory structure zoning could update nor under RIP. So um, I'm glad to see it's finally being looked at. Um, I'm just gonna breeze through three technical things that have already been brought up, um, but I think it would be worthwhile seeing these images um, to give us some context. So yeah, ba basically with the RV certification, uh, the, the state doesn't require this anymore. So I'm not sure why the city feels like it needs to be stricter than the state uh, on, uh, on building code certifications for RVs. This is a state legislation that says we are deregulating RVs. We, we no longer require it. So now the city is saying we should require it. And I just don't know that that's a good step. I think that's gonna work against us in terms of providing more flexibility. RV hookups should not be required. They're not a bad thing. In fact, I've, I like them, but I think the previous policy was better. The previous, previous policy is listed here in the yellow box. You can see that there's a variety of ways that the city previously was allowing or currently is allowing for um, exposing or uh, uh, getting rid of waste. And I think these are all viable strategies and they're less expensive. So I think we should continue that. Um, and yeah, so there's shared primary dwelling, share, sharing the sewer with the primary dwelling, sharing uh, using a black water holding tank, sanitary sewer dump. Um, extension cords were allowed under the current uh, current uh, deregulation or current MT program, and they're not necessarily gonna be allowed under this new proposal, but I think they should be. Um, and lastly, I think I just wanted to focus on this one because this is kind of my forte area, the ADU uh, concept. I think it's just a mistake. I think this is like copying what California did. And I don't think what California has done with allowing for uh, movable tiny homes to be classified as ADUs has actually proven to be a particularly successful program so far. So I think um, just to say that not a lot of them have actually been built. So I think we should do our own thing and see whether our approach is better. Our approach could be just not calling it an ADU. Um, and uh, and we, we, wanna, we wanna allow these things to be built on any type of residential property, whether it has two ADUs or a triplex or fourplex under RIP. And I think we should support that. So we, we wanna see more of this housing type. So let's make it more feasible. I did a study of- Great. Uh, um, Cole, if you could wrap up, forgive me. We're done? Yeah. Actually, Chair, may I jump in for a quick question? Yeah. Certainly. Uh, Cole, could you go on and finish your presentation and be my question to you? And perhaps also go back and address why doesn't it work to have a mobile unit identified as an ADU? Don't we want to limit the number of ADUs? And aren't they substantially similar? Um. No, I don't think they're substantially similar um, actually at all. Like I think one of the reasons why this is a really good housing form is that it's vastly less expensive than an ADU. Like the least expensive ADU you can do right now is about 100,000 bucks for like a conversion of a basement or conversion of a garage. And these we're talking about travel trailers that you get for $10,000 do the infrastructure for five. So this is like eight times cheaper than, a, than an ADU. So I don't think it's the same category. I, I don't, I think it would be a mistake to go down that pathway. 
And I think we should be supporting more housing options. So I, I just don't think we should be conflating the two. Um, uh, as far as finishing the presentation, I'd love to, um, but it's basically just two more slides. Uh, if you can see my screen still, um, can you? <coughs> no. You could reshare. Yeah, I'll be really quick, I promise. So uh, this is a study that I did of mobile dwellings in the Cully neighborhood, and it turns out there's actually a significant number of them. Uh, I included you know, inhabited RVs and tiny houses on wheels, and there were 65 in, in the Cully neighborhood, all of which are shown in those circles. Compar comparing that to ADUs, there's only 60 permitted ADUs. Of granted, of course, there's probably hundreds of more unpermitted ADUs, but that's beside the point. So the point is there's a lot of this housing stock that's already being used. And I think it's a really good idea for us to be formalizing the regulations. Also the broader point here is that it's been working. It hasn't been controversial. Um, and this thing, you know, I think there's every reason in the world to like double down on what we've been doing and, and accelerate it and support it and really allow the market to create, you know, naturally occurring, very low cost affordable housing. This is a good opportunity to do that. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Colton. Uh, Russell, uh, and then Joe Bukowski. Well played, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep that one in mind. <laughs> you are muted, Russell. Thank you. Um, I'm Russ Holflick. Uh, thank you for allowing me to come in today. Uh, livability, sustainability, and affordability is my profession. Uh, but today I wanted to speak to you as a resident. And although there is an extraordinary amount um, that I could spend time on praising you today about the, the plan, I want to focus in on a concern that I have. Uh, and you have my testimony uh, that is lined out in more detail and some photographs I sent along. But today I really want to urge the PSC to do everything within its power to protect the needs of the homeless and at the same time, do not put at risk, put them at risk by allowing them to live within even temporarily in the high risk floodplain zones or wetlands um, around the city. By designing these areas, absorb the energy from regularly and um, unpredictable high volume floods. The homelessness, I do believe, deserve better than to be allocated by zoning into these uh, high risk uh, high risk zones. I also looked at your map and by putting the homeless in the, both some of the open spaces that are designed and even areas of uh, environmental conservation or environmental protection, many of them are proximate to high flood event areas. And uh, if you look at the slopes and topography, designing those areas and even some of the park areas and putting people uh, in those areas is just inherently bringing them into human risk. Uh, today, uh, just in the three areas below my home uh, that I've identified in the Foster Plain flood uh, zone, uh, as well as the Brookside area as Beggars Tick March, we have 93 individuals at my last count who are living in a place where their lives are at risk if we have a massive flood event. Uh, we should not buy zoning encourage people to live in these hazard zones. We also have conflicting uses, as you know, associated with it. Even in my attempts to be able to, uh, to do bird watching in the area um, and have a camera in hand are faced as a threat of government uh, to people who are living in these, in these areas temporarily. But we're seeing destruction of, prop of personal property. We're seeing destruction of public property uh, at high rates uh, as well. Even attempts to clean these areas up have made, it, made me realize that we're dealing with biohazards, human health uh, hazards. Uh, I went out this last weekend to try to remove a bucket that was close to the, creek, the Johnson Creek and I was dealing with human sewage in, in one bucket and urine in, in, a, in another bottle in the other and had to stop. But this is the reality that we are dealing with We've got to do better for, by the people who live proximate uh, to these areas, but we got to get them out of the uh, wetlands. We got to get them out of the natural areas and house them with dignity. And we need to just protect the sanctity of what we have in place in the way of our natural areas in the city. Uh, to, their lives depend on us uh, making some strategic decisions here. Thank you. Thank you. 
Joe. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Joe Wykowski, I use he, him pronouns. I'm the executive director of Community Vision. We provide a variety of supports to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and people with other uh, types of disabilities in the Portland area. Do a lot of work around housing and helping people with affordable housing, the supports, the staffing to live in those homes, employment, and then a lot of work on accessibility and universal design so people can function more independently in their life. And I'm here um, as a passionate person to advocate for uh, small, tiny homes for people with disabilities. We've been working, um, getting grant resources uh, together to help people currently with ADUs, with accessory dwelling units. And we would love to see tiny homes be part of the equation for people we have um, over 4,000 families in the Portland metro area that have uh, their son or daughter living with them from the age of 18 to 20 and maybe into their 40s. A lot of those caregivers are aging, 30, 40, 35, 40% of the caregivers are retirement age. And so we've been working on this housing access program here, trying to move all those people into housing. They'll all need housing eventually. And the numbers are huge. And the tiny home is just such a nice solution. It gives people an anchor with a great affordable home. We've worked with some different ways to put the projects together. So everyone benefits with a little bit of rent and it would give that neighbor contact, that anchor of having a neighbor next door when you don't have your regular staff support and being part of that community. So just encouraging you to think about people with disabilities as part of the equation and thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. And uh, Daniel? Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, my name is Daniel Newberry. I'm <clears throat> the executive director of the Johnson Creek Watershed Council. A couple things I wanted to, to talk about. Um, one has to do with making sure it's easy for people to be able to access some of these alternative housing methods that have been proposed. And in particular, I think anyone who's ever tried to do any big project in the city of Portland knows it's very expensive in terms of the fees and there's a lot of red tape. And when I see kind of what's planned for RVs, I'm thinking that the people who are living in RVs don't have a lot of money to begin with. And so I would really like to encourage um, the city to make it easier, you know, have some sort of uh, mechanism in the code that during declared housing emergency, certain rules and certain fees can be waived. Um, you know, if somebody's living in an RV, they probably are doing it because that's what they feel is their last best opportunity for safe housing. And so please think about uh, reducing fees and reducing red tape. The other thing I want to talk about, and I'm wondering if somebody on the PSE can just um, verify this for me. In this uh, current plan, um, which I'd like to thank uh, BPS for putting together, I really think it's a really good step in the right direction. Am I correct in assuming that open space zoning is not going to be an allowed uh, location for some of these new forms of housing? Is that correct? Uh, I would leave it to others. I would say that it's um, that is part of the conversation that we will. Okay. Yeah. The reason the reason why I mentioned that is just as an example. Every uh, year on one day, we have 150 to 250 volunteers who take five to six tons of garbage out of Johnson Creek in one day. A lot of that is downstream from huge encampments. And as a previous speaker mentioned, you know, not only you know, it's a it's a really not a good place for people's health and safety to be in and near creeks and natural areas. But I just wanted to highlight that there is definitely an environmental crisis that's developing as a result of our housing crisis. So I definitely want to make sure that whatever the city has planned, that um, really camping right next to creeks and in natural areas is really not acceptable. I think there are better ways that are more humane and that have less of environmental impact than allowing that. So thank you very much. 
So I'll just add that I did share a couple images that Daniel sent me um, of Johnson Creek and the, the huge impacts that have been witnessed there. Yeah, this was just last Friday, this downstream from a camp, a huge flotilla of garbage somehow made its way into the creek. And, you know, I think we can avoid environmental and uh, humanitarian crises at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Um, we, uh, we will be continuing the Shelter to Housing Continuum uh, hearing to Tuesday, December 15th at 5 p.m. The written record on MapApp uh, will remain open until Monday, December 21st uh, at 5 p.m. At, ne at next week's meeting, we will have our regular commissioners round robin after we have all the oral testimony included. Commissioners will then need to send their lists of issues and questions to staff, please, by December 30th. And staff will remind uh, Planning Sustainability Commissioning members of this deadline in upcoming communications. And again, next week, thank you for letting me co-chair. Eli, please, please take this baton back. Thank you so much, Steph. I appreciate you stepping up to do that. Um, we are now going to um, stretch for a moment and switch gears to the Historic Resources Code Project. So this is going to be our first work session on the HRCP. And for that, I'd like to welcome up staff, Brandon and Sandra are here, and also Kristen Miner, who chairs the Historic Landmarks Commission and obviously is an expert in this section of code. So welcome. Um, but before we actually begin, I think I should see if there's any disclosures to make um, as we enter into this code project. Any disclosures? You can raise your hand or just chime in. Okay, I'm not hearing any, but I think that there might be one. <laughs> um, just a second here. Okay. Kristen Miner, you know, I'm not seeing her on the screen. So Chair Spivak, um, Kristen Miner is logging in now. Okay, great. Well, let's let's hand it over to staff um, to get oriented and we can check in on that in a moment. So Brandon and Sandra. Great, thank you all. Good afternoon. My name is Sandra Wood. I'm with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. I'm the code development manager there, and I'm working with um, Brandon Spencer Hartle, who is the project manager for the Historic Resources Code Project. <clears throat> and as um, Commissioner Speedback mentioned, Kristen Miner, who is the Historic Landmarks Commission Chair, is joining us. And I'll explain why she's joining us and her role during these conversations um, when we get there. We do have a slideshow to share. So Brandon, if you could just bring that up, we will get started. Um, as Eli mentioned, this is our first work session for the Historic Resources Project, and we have, um, we have a lot to cover. Today's meeting, we're not expecting amendments or decisions today. It's just the beginnings of us getting organized and working with you to make sure we're on the same page and everybody knows how we're going to proceed through these work sessions. Um, our agenda is posted on, on this slideshow. Um, Brandon has some exciting preservation news to share before we get into our work. I wanna do some, histor um, some housekeeping um, after that, which is how are we gonna work together through these work sessions, um, an overview of the PSC um, Historic Landmarks Commission three by three group and their charge and um, then we'll give a historic resources type refresher because that's pretty foundational to this work. And then we'll begin discussions for the proposals um, theme one and two. Theme one is identification of historic resources and theme two is preservation of those historic resources. And that will um, be it for today. So let me pass it on to Brandon to share the exciting news. Sure, thank you, Sandra. And, um... Hello again, commissioners. I'm excited to be here today for our first of what will be many work sessions. And uh, the brain trust that's assembled today is, is pretty impressive. So I think we've got um, a good show ahead. But I was asked um, by a few of my colleagues just to give a quick update on, on a recent listing in the National Register and how it relates to our discussions going forward. Um, as was noted earlier on in the staff report, the Darcel Show Place in Old Town was recently nominated to the National Register 
as Oregon's first nomination to the National Register celebrating LGBTQ plus history. And a week ago yesterday, um, the club was listed in the National Register, making it just the 21st of 93,000 National Register listings to be recognized by the federal government for LGBTQ plus history. And so this is a, a really exciting one. Um, and I did want to mention this today for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I think as the commission gets into discussions, especially down the road in work sessions about the future of historic resources program, collaboration with the Landmarks Commission, the work of staff and how we can be more inclusive, innovative and apply a justice lens to our preservation work, this may be a really good starting point for us to think about the partnerships that are possible. Um, commission, P uh, Landmarks Commission Chair Minor, who's here today um, in her professional hat, did assist with this National Register nomination um, working with Don Horn and Walter Cole to put it on the National Register. So we have an expert in the room in Kristen. Uh, but thinking about, about resources that aren't just buildings or resources that aren't just districts, but thinking about businesses and living history, about histories that haven't been celebrated in our historic resource inventory. Um, I just, did just want to take the time to celebrate that um, Thurcell is now on the National Register and is one of only two places in Portland I can think of that the person for whom the place is significant is still with us to see the, the occasion. I think I think Walter is 90 now. So um, a fun listing, one that will give us some food for thought later on in these discussions. Um, and I think something just to be mindful of as we get into our discussions today and in the months ahead. So Sandra, I'll turn it back over to you for more housekeeping. Thank you, Brandon. I see some. I know it doesn't show up in YouTube, but I do see some planning commissioners pretty excited about this news. And we're all celebrating at home, separate but together. <laughs> okay, um, can we, where are we? Okay, our approach to our work sessions. Um, first, I wanna recognize to the commission that we know this package of amendments is complicated and there's a lot of terminology and there's a lot of hierarchy and there's a lot of things to learn. So we wanna make sure we're giving you sufficient time and the support you need to consider all the public input you've received, our staff proposal, and to give you time to collaborate with the Historic Landmarks Commission. So this slide just shows what our immediate calendar has been and is. Um, as you know, the testimony closed on November 10th. Um, in addition to the 75 um, people who testified during your live hearings, you also received 278 pieces of written testimony. That's a considerable amount of input. So um, I hope you're reading through that. All the testimony is in the map app and that you're considering um, that input as we're um, moving through these deliberations. The next thing that happened is we asked the commissioners to submit any issues that you wanted to discuss in these work sessions. And we have um, the beginnings of a list. Um, I wanna note that we didn't hear from all commissioners but um, we did put together everything we heard from commissioners and organized it by the themes and the proposals. And we um, sent a memo to you on no December 2nd. So commissioners, we're not gonna pull up that memo today. Um, I'm hoping that you can um, just pull it up on your own computer. Brandon, can you put that in the chat please so that the commissioners don't have to go look for a um, Julie's email, they can just Pull we don't have the well. chat, Sandra. We don't have a chat function. Oh, we don't have a chat function. Please do look at for Julie's email that she sent with the materials for today's um, meeting. We'll just be going through that when we when we get there, and if we need to, we can we can definitely pull it up. Um, and Brandon has some resources um, to help us through that conversation. For those tracking along at home, normally we would have that document um, in the room, and you'd be able to pick a copy up. But since we don't have a room today. Um, if you go to the Historic Resources Code Project um, to the Documents and Resources page, um, there's a link to this material there and you can see what the beginning ideas are from the commissioners and questions that they have. So that's how we're gonna keep ourselves organized. Um, I do also wanna mention that um, Kristen Miner, the Historic Landmarks Commission Chair will be participating in each of our work sessions. Um, she's graciously agreed to give us more of her time as she's volunteering at the Landmarks Commission and she's also volunteering here. And she's a resource to the, this commission um, in an advisory capacity because that's part of the role of the Landmarks Commission. 
So today's our first work session. The next meeting that we have amongst some of us will be um, a three by three meeting, which I'll describe in a second. And then we're back here in January for our second work session. Um, we don't expect a um, decision out of this commission until about March. That's our tentative like um, meeting monthly with three by threes in between. So we have some time to do good work. Next I'm going to slide. chime in for a minute to ask, Kristen, you came in while we were doing a disclosure, so I wanted to give you a chance to share any. Oh, great. Yeah, I was wondering when I should do that. Thank you, Chair Spivak. Um, before I participate today, I guess I have a couple uh, declarations, disclosures. Um, one of them is that I do own a house and live in Irvington Historic District. Um, I've lived there since 1997, so quite a, quite a bit before it became a historic district, but still that is um, important. And then the other thing I wanted to declare was that as part of my job, um, either you know my, my current capacity or in my past other jobs, um, I've written quite a number of historic nominations or designations, I should say, in Portland. Um, and those include, uh, well, the Darcel 15 one that is the most recent, um, but also uh, Veterans Memorial Coliseum, uh, Laurelhurst Historic District. Um, I'm not going to name them all, but, you know, just a little smattering. Thank you. All right, and welcome. So glad you could join in for this um, and the ongoing meetings. Um, so let's go back to staff and you can guide us through. Yeah, so our the last piece of housekeeping before we start getting into the substance here is an overview of um, the three by three for this project. Um, after testimony in the round robin last time we met, several of our planning and sustainability commissioners expressed an interest in working more closely with the Landmarks Commission. So we've worked with Kristen and her commission and with our officers to form a new um, three by three with the commission. So this slide um, and the memo that we shared with you shares the charge of that group. And, um, and it describes that basically what we want to use the three by three and the function of it is so that when the PSC is having conversations about issues and it's getting stuck and maybe things are getting way into the details and require more time, a three by three is kind of a relief valve that you can say, can you go work this out with the three by three? Because then we'll have some landmarks commissioners there and that can participate. And to be, um, to be, um, Fair about it. Also, we've um, in included some of BDS um, historic review planners to participate in that too, so we can make sure that the implementation is going to work well. Um, I also think that as you're discussing your potential amendments, you might want to ask the three by three for their opinion about that too, before you actually put the amendment on the list. So that's that second bullet. Um, so that's the main charge is for the three by three to help us with this project. We know there's, there's a lot of appetite amongst our PSC members and amongst some of the Landmarks Commission members to talk about um, broader um, issues um, about the future of the Historic Resources Program. And um, we think this could be also a good venue for that conversation to happen and that collaboration to happen. So when we get to city council, maybe our commission can be more um, our commissions can be on the same page about what we want to see happen in the future of this um, of this project, um, um, this program. I'm sorry. After this project is done, I want to clarify that the three by three won't be making any, any decisions, but they'll workshop ideas and brainstorm ideas to bring back to the full commission. The PSC is the only recommending body on this, so the amendments will have to happen through the PSC. But the three by threes will be meeting between your work sessions. Brandon, did I miss anything? Or Kristen, Eli? The only thing I would add to staff, and, and I'll, I'll look to PSC and to um, Landmarks Chair Minor, is the way we'd like this discussion today and at future work sessions to play out is uh, we will follow the proposal themes. We're gonna go down the list per the memo. And when there is an issue 
or a proposed amendment that warrants additional discussion. I, I think I'll look to the commissioners to um, talk about that issue, to um, give your initial policy responses or sort of take a temperature of where people are at and then have that be, be pushed over to the three by three. There, there are many issues and amendments that, that might not warrant the three by three discussion. And there will be others that, that will warrant a, that additional discussion. So as we get into our work session today, um, Chair Spivak and, and Chair Minor, I'll be looking to you to help, um, help staff identify which of those issues really do need further consideration and exploration. So um, the way that'll work is we will bring it back um, after the, um, three by three for the full idea yeah, that's come up or, or staff have a, a proposed resolution. Um, so there'll be the three by three groups will be interim between your work sessions just to workshop those ideas and look for um, something to bring back to the full commission for, for a straw poll and decision. I'm gonna chime in for one minute on there is, I think that we also shouldn't be shy of providing some direction to our three representatives at the three by three. Um, so in, so we don't necessarily, don't necessarily think of it as just these are the thorny issues, let them figure it out. There may be, that may happen, but it may also be that here's some specific direction we wanna um, give our representatives on the PSC um, so they can try and come up with a creative solution on it. Great, and the slide shows who the three by three representatives are for both the PSC and the Historic Landmarks Commission. Um, so Kat, Steph, and Jeff, thank you very much in advance for your extra time participating in that. And we look forward to seeing you and, and the meeting next week. With that, I think Brandon, I'm passing it on to you now to start the work. Any questions about any of the logistics before we move on? Great. Great, thank you, Sandra and all. Thank you. So as a refresher, um, this project has organized the proposals into five discrete themes, identification, designation, protection, reuse, and administration. Um, for those of you who are uh, listening at home or those commissioners who don't have easy access to the uh, memo that organizes our discussion topics at the right, there's a QR code that you can use to, to look at it in your phone or look at it um, on your tablet at home if you have a moment. Today, we will be focusing our energies on proposal themes one and two which is identification and designation. And many commissioners did submit uh, issues or potential amendment ideas related to themes one and two. We're gonna talk about each of those today, but we'll also take a moment to see if there's anything that commissioners maybe didn't raise in their issues or that's come to them in the last couple of weeks on each of the sub themes within the larger themes of one and two. So the way this will work is use your memo. Um, and when I take, in a few minutes, I'll take my screen down. So I'll be looking to all of you to follow along on your memo. We're gonna go theme by theme, proposal by proposal, and, and have as much discussion as necessary um, based upon what all of you identified as issues. Before we get there, um, I should say, so as we move into theme one, before we get into the discussion of issues, um, both at the round robin and in several of your issue identification emails, you did identify some questions about how, like what changed in 2017 and how staff arrived at this hierarchy of historic resources in the proposal. At the round robin, many PSC commissioners felt comfortable and um, supportive of the idea of a new hierarchy, but several of you did ask what changed in 2017 um, that makes a place like Irvington, which is a historic district, different than Laurelhurst, which is, um, and are these proposals considered a national registered district? So I did just want to spend a couple of minutes answering that question, um, which is to better explain the difference between pre-2017 and post-2017 resources, specifically so that we can have our discussion today around the hierarchy and the, um, the designation process. So as quick background, um, we shared this map with you at your October um, 12th briefing, I believe it was which was a map of the city's designated districts. And in that map, we showed three different types of districts, city designated conservation districts, historic districts, and national register districts. Um, this map is based upon uh, resources that were both city designated and those resources that were listed by the National Park Service. Specifically to identification of historic resources. At the left, you'll see the hierarchy of historic resources as currently recognized in Title 33. 
that hierarchy applies the greatest uh, amount of regulation to historic landmarks and historic districts that have been listed in the National Register. It applies a slightly lower level of protection to historic landmarks that have been designated by the city but have no National Register status. And then the lowest level of protections to conservation landmarks and conservation districts that have been city designated. Um, there are two categories of resources that are not designated but included in the inventory. Those are ranked and unranked resources. And so as I'll talk about in a few minutes with the hierarchy, um, the proposal is uh, incorporating changes that occurred in 2017 um, at the state level to land use school five and how local governments are required to protect historic resources. Previous to 2017 in the city of Portland, when a national register listing occurred, that site was automatically designated or automatically identified as a historic landmark or a historic district through our zoning code. So when Irvington, for example, was listed in the National Register in 2010, our zoning code automatically identified that as a historic district. Um, that practice had uh, affected all National Register listings up until 2017. And so many of our historic landmarks and historic districts have that designation type are protected in that way um, because of their listing in the National Register. In 2017, the Land Conservation and Development Commission adopted new rules that apply to historic resources statewide um, I was involved in that effort as a city's representative, as were other city planners from around the state. And the rule change, among many things, uh, directed cities to have a, effectively a one-size-fits-all approach for protecting resources listed in the National Register right out the gate automatically. So beginning in 2017, local governments uh, became required to apply demolition review, which we already did, to National Register listings but are not able to apply any additional protections to listings in the National Register unless or until there's a subsequent local process to apply additional protections. What that means is the state has given us clear guidance that National Register listing and the protections that apply automatically are baseline across the state and that we, um, for the time being, rely on the goal five rule um, and are asked to adopt local programs in our zoning code that conform with that new rule. I should say two last things. Um, one is, this was a question that was related to this. Um, the new Goal 5 rule and a recent state Supreme Court case tell us that if it's not designated either locally or by the National Register as a landmark or district, um, properties can be inventoried without asking for owner consent. So that's those bottom two categories. And last but not least, when a local government does seek to designate a resource, i.e. make it a landmark or a district, a majority of owners must affirmatively consent to that designation. Um, so there is a difference between those categories in blue at the bottom and those things that are higher up. Just to give really quickly an example of what this looks like on the ground. Um, here are two historic sites in Portland that are significantly associated with the African-American experience. At the top is the Otto and Verdell Rutherford House. It was listed in the National Register five years ago. Upon its listing in the National Register, it automatically became a historic landmark on our official zoning map and is subject to the protections that apply to historic landmarks, demolition review and historic resource review primarily. Because the state law changed in 2017, when the Billy Webb Elks Lodge was listed in the National Register this past summer, it automatically became subject to demolition review per that new state, state uh, admin rule pertaining to goal five. And the only way that the capital C city could apply additional regulations above and beyond that would be for a land use process to locally designate the resource. So that's why there's a difference in 2017 was that change in state rule. Um, it gives us new opportunities to take a look at our hierarchy and how we treat historic resources. And the way staff have proposed doing that is to create a new um, category or two categories for National Register landmarks and districts. There'd be the landing spot upon listing in the National Register and then allow for decision-making up and down that hierarchy in proposal to be um, for designation. So everything that was listed in the National Register in before 2017, it was automatically identified as a historic district or historic landmark, would stay a historic landmark or historic district for these proposals. Um, everything that was listed in the future would become, everything listed by the National Park Service in the future would be listed at that National Register uh, baseline. Future designation decisions could move it up to a conservation or historic level of protection. I should say that the hierarchy is about the regulations. So it's how, how our Title 33 applies protections. There may be some properties that are more important than others, but don't necessarily end up at the top of the hierarchy. This is about 
how we apply our regulations and the, uh, let's call it the sort of layers of the onions of protections, not so much how important or significant a place may be. So we may have some properties that are at the national register level whose owners are not supportive of ascending to the historic level. It would mean they have less protections, um, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily less important to the community. So I know that was a little bit of um, memory lane for some people. I know it's a, it's a sort of a complicated storyline. And I think with that, what I'd like to do is to move us into our discussion of proposal theme one uh, with the way we imagine this to go today is we're having a discussion. Um, we're hoping that commissioners can give staff um, a temperature of where you're at on each of the proposals and to give us um, some direction either to take to the three by three or to bring back with you with amendments in the future. And Brandon, just before you leave that slide, with the example, I think it was really helpful to have the two examples before about the landmarks. The, the Billy Wilkes Lodge, for example, wasn't designated before 2017. So in the proposed types, it would be at the bronze level. That's right. Right, okay. And then the other property would be automatically brought over because it was designated before 2017 to that gold level in the proposed hierarchy. Right, because we treat it as a historic landmark today, it would stay treated as a historic landmark. Um, there is a discrepancy in the protections that apply in the code today. The city designated and national register listed landmarks. One of the pieces of the hierarchy is to put those two things together so we don't effectively have two categories of city historic landmark. Any questions about that before we move on? I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll have to refer back to this slide, I think probably when we get to theme two. So where I'd like to take us um, for- Oriana has a question, Brent. Yeah. Yeah, do you mind going back to that slide? Um, it would be helpful to remind us, like as we take into account equity uh, in these conversations, like what kinds of resources are more likely to be landmarks versus inventory and kind of what historical context they fit in. And specifically, like I'll, I'll ask it maybe a little more bluntly for um, LGBTQIA plus uh, or research or uh, uh, resources in the inventory or landmark status that uh, have been um, part of uh, black history in Portland or indigenous history in Portland or other POC history. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, our historic resources inventory. So everything on the everything on this chart today um, is not representative of the fullness of the city's story. And so right out the gate, I would to respond to your question that our historic resources are not equitably distributed geographically, thematically, temporally. And we have many communities who have um, both long and not so long histories in the city that are not represented at all on the inventory. So we think about the Darcel listing which would come in at the National Register landmark level, that is the first resource associated with LGBTQ history to be listed in, in any list for historic significance um, in the city. And certainly um, it shouldn't be the last, but we're just now seeing that kind of listing come along. Um, for black history, we have citywide 725 landmarks. So we get each of the levels together. Only four of those landmarks have been designated for black history those four have all been designated in the last 10 years. Three of those four have been designated in the last five. Um, we do have um, a pretty good collection of AAPI individual landmarks and districts, uh, not representative of the full community, but there's been a little more work on that topic. But um, geographically, thematically, um, racially, economically, today's current inventory is not representative of the city. The hope would be having more categories of designation and a better and more inclusive process for identifying resources at the significant level or having um, local designation options that we might be able to push forward on this conversation, future work, staff spending more time and energy to ensure that that list over time gets more representative. I think I'll also say on the LGBTQ plus, of, as mentioned earlier, of the 93,000 National Register listings across the country, only Darcells is number 21 of LGBTQ history. And my understanding is almost all of those 21 resources have been listed in the last couple of years. So this is a this is an inequity that exists nationally, certainly. And I think you, this commission will be really helpful in giving us guidance and direction on where to put that energy um, so that we can 
begin the long process of doing right by making this a more diverse, equitable list of resources and then think about how we can infuse justice into the work we do going forward. Thank you. Um, and I'm gonna um, clarify something. I think I've got this right, but although you described a project starting off as a national historic in the bronze category and then being lifted up, it doesn't have to go through that way, right? It is perfectly possible to set something up immediately as a conservation landmark or district or historic district. Um, so it doesn't have to, the, the, the national listing is not a precedent um, before you can do anything else. Um, so I'm gonna um, ask just for process, since I can only see four of us on the screen right now, um, if you wanna raise your hand, please do it virtually because I have another screen showing hands raised. Um, but I think that, yeah, when you get through the, the slides, I think Brandon, it might be helpful to stop screen sharing so we can see everybody's faces. I agree. And last thing I'll say to Chair Spivak, and then I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to all of you. Um, a resource could could enter into this hierarchy at any level. So let's say a um, an owner, let's say the owner of um, Dean's Barbershop and Beauty Supply were interested in being a city conservation landmark. They could come in at that level. Or let's say a property owner uh, in the Jade District was interested in making a sign a National Register landmark, they could come in at that level. Um, but when we get to proposal two, we'll be talking about how things might move up or down um, that hierarchy based upon significance and owner interest and appropriateness for the community. So I'll stop my screen share. We're gonna focus today on, um, start with theme one, which is identification. And I'll ask everyone to refer to their memo. Um, if, if I guess I'll start with, we'll, if there's any general comments on the theme, and then we're gonna go through each proposal number, one A, one B, one C. Um, I only had uh, one issue from PSC in this category of themes, and that was from Commissioner Borlazzo um, regarding the hierarchy. So maybe we'll start by uh, the proposal 1A is redefine the historic resource inventory as an umbrella term. And I will pause just to see if there's an issue, concern, discussion that was not raised in your uh, emailed issues to me before we move on to the next one. Thank you. Any concerns or discussion on that item? Silence means we're supporting staff's recommendation. Easy, it's nice, nice to get started off that way. Okay, staff, you're batting a thousand. <laughs> well, that was a nice meeting today, Eli. Uh, no, we'll move on to proposal uh, one, one B, which I think we will have a little more discussion on. Uh, proposal one B is to establish a clear hierarchy of the historic resource types that would be included in the historic resource inventory. And Commissioner Bordalazzo was interested in further discussion based upon the Landmarks Commission's earlier comments on this proposal. Yeah, if I may, I think the, the idea, well, first of all, this is in response to the Historic Landmark Commission testimony, which I found compelling. And it's kind of a response of the chart that you just had a moment ago, uh, Brandon, that is also on page 26 of volume one. Um, and basically, while I, like the, the clarity of, you know, having the, the gold, the silver and bronze levels, I think kind of creates definitely um, a more understandable hierarchy. I was compelled by the idea of putting the National Register Landmarks District um, um, into the, essentially the city designated uh, uh, category. So it looks like for the most part, some of those could be in the historic or uh, district landmark level. And maybe some could be uh, the more of the, you know, the next level down the conservation district level. So um, I'd like to, to maybe have a conversation a little bit about that because in my mind, uh, I, I think this, the way that it's uh, um, structured right now with the lowest level of protection, we may, we may lose some of those resources that are currently in the National Register level. I also found compelling as a side note, also the, the uh, uh, um, Historic Landmark Commission recommendation to um, show the, the type of change that could be accepted or allowed, not necessarily just a level of protection. Okay, um, anyone would like to chime in? Um, Kristen, yeah. Unmute. Um, I, I would I would love to explain a little bit more about um, the Landmarks Commission position on that, if this is the right time to do that. I think so. Yeah. 
Okay, super. Um, so there's a number of reasons why we believe strongly that having national register properties um, shouldn't really be a category in our own city hierarchy chart. And one of those is, as Brandon mentioned, um, it, it, it sort of locks us in to treating properties differently that were um, nominated before 2017 and after 2017. Um, so, so that's a pretty arbitrary date. It doesn't really have anything to do with the resource itself. And certainly there are more important um, resources that were nominated after 2017 sometimes than before. So we'd really like to get rid of that for that reason. We also, uh, we find the hierarchy chart hard to understand because it is really only about one metric, which is that kind of level of protection. Um, and having national register resources below say conservation districts doesn't really reflect their relative importance. Um, so we'd like to see that the chart reflect the city's goals or management of these districts. And that would be, you know, if we could sort of come up with an anticipated level of change or, you know, a goal, honestly, for these districts, I think it would help us understand this hierarchy chart quite a bit more. Um, another reason is that really any resource, um, districts or individual uh, resources should have the capability to move up or down the chart. I mean, that's kind of, we're all trying to create these processes to do that. But having national register as its own category, you know, that's out of our control. We don't really have the capability to have any, you know, anything move into it or off of it. So we should be really talking about, you know, a, a series of processes that we can control. And then finally, um, I really appreciated the question about um, LGBTQ and um, other sort of underrepresented resources. And I just wanna make it really clear that the system we've been living under has been completely inequitable because it really gives the only power of you know, having any protections to those resources or districts where um, there's been a lot of social continuity, a lot of wealth. And um, so those inherently qualify those areas to be on the national register. And when that's our only um, available category, well, that's what we get is, you know, a whole bunch of resources that really reflect, you know, that sort of highest level. And I think what the Landmarks Commission would like to see are um, a, a slightly different treatment, um, you know, really take it on ourselves as a city to um, to provide a more equitable availability. And part of that is certainly just offering these different levels. You know, we haven't had that in the past. But I'd also like to have you think about um, inserting a lowest level that isn't, you know, national register based, but is perhaps easier for, um, for folks who haven't had that much um, access to preservation um, as a way, you know, sort of a foot in the door. Thank you. Um, I've, anyone else have comments? I've got a couple of questions, but I'll let Jeff start and I'll go next. Jeff. You're on mute. Jeff, we're not quite hearing you, but we're trying to lip read. There, finally, I'm on a, a Surface uh, tablet that's not working very well. Uh, I, I guess I want to understand the proposal, Ben, and 
Kristen. So what happens to national register districts under what you guys are proposing? Do they become a conservation and or historic district automatically or what do we, how do we regulate them? That's a great question. And, and, and probably the details of this are something that, you know, if you're willing, this, this would be a really good candidate for us to talk about in the three by three. But uh, the way I envision it, we certainly as a city have the power to say that anything that gets listed on the national register should within some period of time trigger a level of protection hearing or a, you know, a, a, a slot, you know, where are we gonna put this resource hearing? And we can decide, is that resource really best at the conservation district level? Is it, should it be a historic district? Um, but we can, you know, we can certainly do this within some period of time after a national register decision. I, my concern is, and perhaps this is a three by three issue, is right now, for the most part, this is true, correct me if I'm wrong, Brandon, the National Register districts have never gone through a city land use process. They became that way because 51% of the homeowners in a district successfully petitioned for that designation. And I'd be very nervous if we took what 51% of the people in a district wanted and made that automatically a binding land use zoning overlay of some sort. We don't do that. We don't allow neighborhood associations to come to us and say 51% of the people in our neighborhood want to be downzoned. Uh, we, we don't, as a land use structure, we don't grant that sort of authority to 51% of the population. That's not how we zone and regulate. So I, I would not want to have any sort of a mandatory or automatic process that allows particularly a residential neighborhood that's achieved National Register District to automatically get standing under our zoning code. If that my concern and I hope makes sense, but perhaps that's, there's something in there we could, we could figure out that would address my concern, but also do what Kristen's hoping to do. Um, I'll jump in a minute and then I'll go to Kat and Oriana. Um, thank you, Jeff, for sharing that. I, I wasn't, sh I'm glad that clarity is, is out there. Um, I um, feel like we have gotten historically into a place where we've got, as um, Stat pointed out, a really inequitable distribution of resource protection. And I feel that's partly because of the pipeline that we've done where we start with national registration and that queues up additional protections. So I actually kind of like the way the state has framed it for us where um, there will be registrations and we will provide those historic resources with demolition review. Um, and beyond that, it's a local decision. Um, and so if the question is nomenclature and like the organization, the way this chart looks, um, then I'm totally open to another way of presenting it because it does look a little funny to me having national register at the bottom um, where we know that those resources actually have all different levels of, of historic value. Um, so I get that piece of it, but if it's the idea of conferring immediate um, protection for those resources or even forcing the city's hand to make a designation, I would rather retain local control on that. Um, Kat. Um, thank you. So a couple thoughts and I just wanna frame this. Um, first of all, just where my head's at. Appreciate Christian, you describing um, more clarity with where Landmarks Commission's at. I do think, I think we can all figure this out. I think we're, I think what I'm hearing first of all is there is some commonality and it's just maybe working through um, how to all come into an alignment. But first of all, in building codes, national code is kind of the floor. And then local communities build more restrictions or more local emphasis on top of that. So I, in my head, being an architect and I think building codes, that's kind of how I see this is national registration is the floor. You know what, it, it doesn't go through the community necessarily, but we got to recognize it. It's important. It's got certain ramifications and meanings and therefore we need to know how to deal with it in the zoning code when it is a national um, a just national landmark or district and therefore all the other layers on top of it kind of build on community importance and what it means 
well, I'll just leave it at that. I don't need to reiterate that. So that's kind of where my head's at. And to your point, then, Kristen, I also agree with there needs to be triggers. Absolutely. In that. Um, so if somebody comes in, you've got a national registration. Um, I think a process needs to needs to be gone through to determine whether it gets elevated or not. It might be that our entire community, you know, the Portland, the greater Portland community, not just the, the individual or the or the neighborhood, um, doesn't necessarily agree. They agree it's important, but maybe not as important to us as a city um, for other reasons, and therefore they leave it at national, or we elevate it into conservation, or we elevate it, you know, further from there. So I think it allows. It actually builds more equity into a system, but there's probably other ways to go about that too. And that's why I said, I think, I think we're saying some similar things. We wanna strengthen equity and we wanna get some kind of clarity between how this hierarchy is working and what we're trying to achieve with the, with the hierarchy. And yeah, maybe it's nomenclature, maybe it's not, but for whatever it's worth, that's just kind of where my head's at with a, a starting point. Thank you. I'm Oriana. Yeah, I want to go back to the good point that Jeff raised about kind of how um, uh, historic district status uh, gets applied at the national level, this idea of like 51% of neighbors, and thinking about the kinds of neighborhoods that organize around that uh, historically and probably are likely to in the future as well. There's a lot of privilege associated with, with that organizing. So in kind of being conscious of that, that issue and the equity piece and kind of the difference between the the national uh, registry versus like the conservation districts and the difference in terms of like where those conservation districts are in Portland, like who who potentially benefits from that that preservation. Um, I like what Kat said about that analogy with with building codes and, and setting a floor and then having some sort of community process to build from there. I think that makes sense to me so that there is community feedback and a valuing of the equity or a valuing of who's benefiting from, uh, from the status. Because uh, I think I, we heard uh, concerns from folks you know, about the losing status for certain neighborhoods, but also interest in certain neighborhoods that, that may create equity concerns at the same time. So I wonder what it would look like to have like a trigger associated with um, importance in like black history or indigenous history or LGBTQIA history or history for folks with disabilities, like different marginalized communities and using that as kind of a starting point and maybe even like a fast track through um, for, for a designation. And then some further review process that might look like going through the, the PSC and the, the Landmarks Commission or some additional public feedback, you know, the way we, we see land use decisions where people come in and testify about that. What does it look like for someone to bring the historic uh, landmark at the national level or your district uh, designation to then a process that looks at basically revising, thinking about it as like a code that we have a, a landmarks code, which is this hierarchy and we're just trying to figure out how to fit or, or revisit certain aspects in. So sorry, that was a little scattered, but I think that's kind of where my, my head is starting to go and, and really resonating with what both Jeff and Kat said. Okay, um, Kat. Thank you. I just wanted to, Oriana, I love that looking at some kind of trigger for, for marginalized communities, just FYI, I wrote that down as soon as you said that. Um, that's, um, it's, it's, provo it's provocative. Um, and I forgot to address, I agree, there's kind of this wonkiness that Kristen brought up about the whole 2017 thing, right or wrong. And so I think it's something to add to our agenda to talk about on the three by threes. But in my mind, to me, that's just something we're about to clean up. It's a placeholder until we kind of get through some cleanup work. And then I'm hoping we, the, we, the city, the Bureau gets through some cleanup work of what's happened after then. And we kind of end up with a level playing field after that. So for what it's worth, that's a temporary thing and if that's not a correct understanding um or true that i really need to kind of understand that because it it is clunky unless in my mind it's kind of a temporary cleanup um i'll jump in for a moment i think i agree that some historically marginalized communities or communities of color um, i like the idea of having a special expedited process and as i mentioned before that could be modeled on the code project we did with faith-based communities and nonprofits providing affordable housing. I mean, it could be led by bureaucracy. They, they, those communities don't have to hire their own staff, their own historic researchers to um, put the proposal together. 
And that might be one way to build some more equity into our program. Um, and in terms of the districts, I mean, I, I, this is a good time to say, um, Kat asked me last time, are you gonna try and um, propose reductions in protection status for districts? And I'm not gonna do that with this code update, but I am looking at the, a couple of districts that are either one or two large districts that either just got historic status or may soon. And I also don't wanna queue them up immediately for additional protections beyond required by the state. I think we really should take ownership at a city level of what those protections are um, independent of the national registration process. Um, so that's that's kind of where I'm thinking. Other thoughts that's, on this topic? That's Steph, um, oh, I'll let Steph go. Steph, I do want to clarify a couple things. Okay. Um, one thing yeah, is this is clarify not, first because then we'll forget and then we'll get the stuff. <laughs> Thanks. This is not as a city the first time we've rewired this system. Uh, back in 1996, when the state owner consent law went into effect and new goal five rules were drafted then, um, they were national register nominations that were in progress that previously would have been honorific and then became de facto historic districts. And at that time, when those wires were redrawn based upon the change in Salem, um, my predecessors who were um, strategic and, and gave us an outcome that had both a efficient and a inequitable outcome potentially, um, the automatic identification of historic landmark and historic district status was done in large part to one, work within the owner consent law that exists and two, um, give city staff and the Bureau of Development Services certainty upon the date of listing in the National Register. So just to give a quick example of how this works for me, um, when the National Park Service notifies uh, city staff that a resource has been listed in the National Register, staff immediately go to the official zoning map and identify that resource on the map. Um, it worked really well in the past for efficiency that National Register listing would automatically mean that a new historic district or historic land would be added to the official zoning map, giving both property owners and reviewers clarity and certainty about the regulations that apply. One of the primary drivers for staff creating a category of resource type for National Register listing is to provide a bucket into which immediately upon listing on a National Register, the city can ensure that the state goal five regulations are applied uh, per the letter of that law and give our colleagues at Bureau of Development Services clear understanding about what regulations apply to those properties right out the gate. And so there is a efficiency uh, that's on our mind back to 1996, but also now in having the National Register, maybe there's a different phrase, maybe there's a different word, I'll defer to all of you, be a category so that we have clearly implementable regulations that apply to the type of resource that's subject to goal five regulations. Thank you. And the last thing I'll say, the second thing is, uh, today there's confusion in places like Laurelhurst and Peacock Lane, where those resources have been listed in the National Register. The state admin rule tells us we can only apply a demolition review and we must do that. Um, but property owners there get confused and think there's historic resource review that applies or maybe that there's other regulations. And so by having the official zoning map not have a bucket to drop these new National Register listings into, whether or not there's a trigger for subsequent local designation of protection, that's really driven a lot of our thinking about having the National Register be at the bottom so that there's a clear place that it lands on day one upon listing. Thank you. I'm Steph. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate um, all the comments so far. Um, I, I'm also thinking about you know, staff capacity and, and time and priority, you know, I think as, as we're going forward in terms of, uh, I appreciate Brandon talking about like, when something happens at the National Register, where does it go? Creating that efficiency and uh, um, to Oriana's and others part uh, points earlier, how do we um, then create a trigger? We Kat also talked about it. How do we create a trigger for having conversation about uh, where that um, those protections ultimately go? Uh, I think that we have um, we have seen in partly in in uh, what has been designated and what has only very recently been designated that. Uh, uh, the owner consent law is part of this, um, that, that those with um, access to an understanding of, of the current system, access to, um, to wealth um, and, and privilege are more likely to, um, to initiate those processes um, and given um, limited staff capacity that um, can preclude sometimes some um, 
uh, some other more intentional conversations uh, that we as a city um, need to have in order to align with our goals. So um, that's that's just part of the lens that I'm listening um, to to others' remarks, which I appreciate. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Um, Oriana. Yeah, something uh, Steph just said uh, made me think back to uh, the the comment that uh, Brandon made about. Uh, uh, in particular, Black landmarks only being designated in the last 10 years. That 2017 kind of mark uh, becomes more significant thinking about it in, in that context of if we're kind of allowing in some of these, these districts that had designation before a certain time, like what equity lens are we bringing in to really account for that privilege that went into folks being able to access these resources and, um, and hire the appropriate people to, to make it happen. I think before we kind of just blanketly bring things in we wanna be conscious of that. And again, what kind of like mechanisms can we put in place to make it very easy uh, for districts or landmarks that uh, benefit BIPOC our LGBTQIA communities uh, in and then create maybe a little bit higher level of scrutiny for, um, for uh, neighborhoods or landmarks that, that don't. And that's not to, to keep people out. I wanna be really clear about that, but just more to, to kind of start to apply more of an equity lens to this work and just think about that, that privilege associated with being able to make this really exciting thing happen for a neighborhood or a building. Thanks. Um, so I'll take a pause here. It's always a little harder to facilitate discussions where there's not a clear vote at the end. So I'm gonna suggest that we do a little straw poll maybe two of them. One of them is do we want to kick this issue to the three by three? Um, and the other, if we say yes, then give them a little more direction. And if we say no, then we can do a straw poll on staff's recommendation on this. Um, so if that sounds okay, then let's first see whether we think this should be kicked to the three by three. And Chair Spivak, I think one thing I'll ask, I think I'm hearing two things today. One is the hierarchy and two is how things get added to the hierarchy or moved up and down in the hierarchy. I'm not sure if that changes your straw poll, but but I think I'm hearing a little bit of proposal too also let's here today. Of, yeah, let's how, um, how do things get added or, or yeah and I was just, yeah what exactly are we straw polling? Okay. Be um, so I was looking back to original notes on my sheet here, but I think you're right, we should um, be more clear about it. Um, and so first would be the hierarchy itself. Maybe that's the, is that where you have um, anything identified as a national historic resource, national registration is sort of at the bottom of it. And then the city sort of can, if it wants to or not, grab from that and put it into one of the other three categories, gold, silver, bronze. Um, so that's as depicted in the, in the sketch that we had, is that, um, is that enough? But, but the things wouldn't come in from the national register as staff's proposed it, a national registered designation doesn't immediately confer any benefits beyond the um, beyond those required by the state. Does that um, does that reflect enough thing we can decide whether we want the three by three to um, cogitate on that and get back to us, or we want to say we've got other things to to work on next? Yeah, Kristen. Yeah. Um. I didn't say very much about this, but there's there's another aspect of the hierarchy chart that um, I would love the opportunity to sort of get into the weeds a little bit more on, and that is the idea of perhaps having another level. So if we have, you know, if we're just talking about districts for a second, then, we, you know, we have a historic district, a conservation district, and then, you know, I, I actually think we could explore the idea of another level entirely that is, um, you know, perhaps less driven by traditional national register standards. Um, and, and I don't, you know, I, I just think it's something that we have this opportunity right now as a city to look at, you know, what could work. And I'm not necessarily, you know, I'm not necessarily wedded to this idea, but I do think it would be great to have the opportunity to talk about it more. Okay. I'm not sure I'm hearing. Okay. Um, I'm seeing Kat and then Katie. I'm seeing real hands now. Well, I guess just quick, quick question. 
to Kristen is what what are we trying to accomplish with another level? And that's um, so maybe if you had just a brainstorm on some thoughts on because I'm not sure I was gathering that um, if what we're what we're solving for. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think part of that is actually defining what our goals are for each level. And I would say, you know, to get into that conversation, I would say that um, we should be defining how much we want them to change based on, you know, what their what their real purpose is. And right now, there's there's not a lot of difference between a conservation district and a historic district. Um, you know, I yes, conservation districts have two track. Um, and, and I guess I would say it's it's perhaps alterations are, are somewhat less compatible. You know, there's a little bit more flexibility, but we're not really defining what it means. And I guess I'd like to explore the possibility of a, of a third level so that we can um, we can look at ideas such as are there are there places that we could really bolster a sense of identity um, and and social continuity without necessarily um, pushing a a strong um, what's the word I want I guess I guess just um, the the national register based compatibility standards. So could it be an echo district? You know, it could be sort of the perfect spot for saying, look, you know, the city wants to encourage change here to some degree. Um, you know, so we're so we're really setting up this this th these these buckets in which we can define what we want those to be in future. I'm not sure we have that right now. And I'm not sure that two levels is really enough to capture everything that we have in the city or that, you know, I mean, not everything in the city, but everything that is potentially a district. Did I get an answer, Kat, or? <laughs> we can also go to Katie. Uh, let's go to Katie next, and then I got Jeff after Katie. I, I hardly have the vocabulary for this, um, but I was thinking that, Kristen, that you were, you, were thought, you were talking about like perhaps districts that would be more like ethnic districts or um, historical around a, a particular group of people or something like that. Was that what you were thinking or? Um, or, or was it broader than that or bigger or smaller or something? I, I was actually just trying to help. Yeah, no, like, thank you yeah. so much. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that the idea of a cultural district, if you know if that's kind of what you had in mind, should be captured at any level that we have. So districts can be important for their architecture, for their, you know, cultural background. I mean, in fact, we have one, you know, which is the uh, New Chinatown, Japantown yeah. Cultural District, right? That's a National Register District and, you know, hasn't been treated terribly well, but we have one. Um, so anyway, it's, it's not necessarily about you know, sort of any one, I, I, I would be hesitant to sort of slot, you know, anything of sort of ethnic background into, a, you know, a lower level automatically. I don't think that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, ben. Oh, sorry, no, I said Ben, Jeff. Sorry. Uh, to try to move along. I mean, I, I think we want to, be judicious on what we kick to three by three so we have time to really dwell on the right issues. And I, and I am hearing two different issues right now. The first one is the one for national register districts. Right now, they get no particular special treatment under this code proposal. They don't automatically move into a, a different a city district. They stay as a national district. 
And I would recommend we just keep it there. I'm not sure we need three by three to kick it around. So that's that's my first answer. I mean, I'm on three by three, I'm willing to do it, but my pr preference would be that issue not become a three by three that we stick with the current proposal. Nothing additional, no, no city process automatically opens up for a national registered district. The second issue, which where I agree 100% with Kristen is, if you look at the actual language, there is very, very little difference between a historic district or landmark and a conservation district or landmark. I mean, the regulations are pretty vague and broad and you could easily, if something qualifies as conservation, it could easily qualify as historic and vice versa because the language is so overlapping. I'm not sure what we do about that. I mean, that is a fundamental, to address that, that's a pretty fundamental change in the code language we've been presented with. So my attitude has been, that's just the nature of historic review, I guess. You, you get pretty broad language that can cover a lot of different things and maybe that's not so bad. So I, I don't know what we do about that, quite frankly. If that's, a, that, that's a big lift, it seems to me, to, to tackle that and say, we want clear differentiation in code language between the two and maybe we need a third. And I wouldn't think of the three necessarily as hierarchy as much as there's three different kinds of, potentially three different kinds of historic districts. But right now we have two. And when I say districts, I mean landmarks and districts. We have two and the language that tells you where you qualify is almost non-differential. There's such minor differences. It's almost a difference without a purpose. So I don't know can what I we just, do about that. Can I say a quick thing? And, and I guess maybe it's a question for Brandon. So correct me if I'm wrong. The way I've understood this is we have just, we have the National Historic, which has just has a demolition block protections, that's about it. The next level conservation district basically is a two track system. So to me, it's paralleling what we already have in code. It's not introducing a new concept. So just like we kind of have right now in, in some neighborhoods, you can either kind of follow a standards route or you can choose to do something a little bit different and ask for design review or then the next level is design review and period you're going through design review or historic landmarks review. And so it's just following a structure we already have in our code. I guess that's one question is, am I understanding that correctly, Brandon, in some res in, in those respects? So to me, that logically makes sense. And then, okay, maybe we need to finesse what prod what areas are one or the other, but um, anyway. Does that make any sense, Brendan? Yeah. yeah, I think, Aldrin, when the conservation district concept was invented here in 1977, the language that was used by these two bodies, which is nice that the, the marriage is here again, was that conservation districts were to be protected as less than historic districts, meaning they were important. They were eligible for designation, but the appropriate management strategy was something less rigorous than would be applied to a historic district. I think there's two big things here why, why the themes are organized the way they are. There's the designation of a resource, right? There's the act to say, this is an important thing. It's got, it's got a significance to one or many of Portland's communities. And so it's worthy of landmark or district status. And then designation conveys regulations, Title 33 uh, protections that are about how that resource gets managed over time. The, the idea of the hierarchy that is presented is there are, uh, telescoping regulations that go up that ladder, such that a resource that's at the bronze level may be really important and just as important as something at the gold level, but for us as a community, it doesn't make sense to protect it at the gold level. The hierarchy gives the ability to move things up and down based upon other competing land use goals about the significance of the resource. And frankly, the, the uh, circumstances of the owner. There may be times where because of the owner uh, of the building either refusing to consent or because the owner of the building not having the capital, um, that it may make sense to protect something at the bronze level, even though it's really, really important because we're at the time of designation factoring many things. And I think we have to remember that the intent of the hierarchy is, is about which bucket of regulations a property falls into, that, that that graphic of the hierarchy is just a way to communicate what the code is doing, which is to say, there are a couple levels of protections. And when a property owner is coming in to alter their building or to take something down, 
planners at BDS and, and Kristen and her fellow commissioners know exactly what the regulations are for their property. Or let's say someone's renting commercial space in a building, they know whether or not their exterior storefront improvement will require historic resource review, or if it can meet community design standards, or if there are no exterior regulations. So some of the thing with hierarchy is it's telescoping and it's uh, in staff's mind, a continuation of what we've always done, which is we have a couple of flavors of regulation that's based upon the, the appropriateness of that regulation at the time of designation. The difference is instead of National Register dropping in at the very top of the list, National Register would drop in at the bottom of the list. And we'd use that statewide baseline as the, the starting point. Thanks. Ask a quick question and let someone else go. This concept of bronze, silver, gold, that's not in code. That's not, you're not proposing that as any kind of a regulatory device, correct? This is just a really confusing knot. And so we, we put together that hierarchy diagram and the gold, silver, bronze is a, an intent, intentionally a, a helpful device, whether it's worked that way or not, I don't know. But, but it's not reflected in code. So I think so. sometimes we get confused when we discuss from a policy level concepts like gold, silver, bronze, but they have no reality in the code. We're not regulating based on those concepts. So I, I, for one, find it confusing when it's not clear when we're talking policy untethered from code or policy that we can now find in the code because. What is in the code is, in, the intent is if you, if you are a reviewer, property owner, tenant, you can look at a property and know what bucket it falls into. Is it the historic level, the conservation level, or the national register? Right. It, it, okay. the, that the I intent is it's it's regulated as one of those things, not a hybrid of many. Right. But as we just discussed with Kristen, once you know which bucket you're in, am I historic or am I conservation? When and I understand the difference is historic should have a higher level of protection than conservation. When you go to the code language, there's not much difference unless I'm missing something in the kinds and intensity of regulation one gets versus the other. Maybe it's something that's sort of intuitive to the Landmarks Commission, but as someone just reading the code language, you don't see much difference in the way we regulate the two. But the ability- a Good or bad thing, I'm just making sure. Right. But Jeff, the ability to be able to use standards in a conservation district is huge. It's exactly okay. the same debate as we had in the um, during Doza for outside um, outside of Central City, right? In Central City, you have to go through the so, design commission. Yeah. Outside, you can point. go. Yeah, so, so that it, you can go through standards without any historic review in a conservation. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Big point. I missed that. I, I can't nail that. Um, I think it's a great way to think about it, um, and I appreciate the use of gold, silver, bronze because even though they're um, not explicitly mentioned in the code. They help me keep track of some names of levels of protection I can never remember. Um, so I appreciate that. Okay. Um, Thank you for that clarification, Sandy. Yeah, so yeah, I agree, Jeff, that it, is, it does seem um, like they're very similar reading through them, but that's a real key difference. Um, Oriana, you've been waiting patiently. Oh yeah, no problem. This has been really interesting discussion. Um, so, so initially I'd raise my hand uh, to make maybe a proposal for how to address this issue which is I think before we decide to kick it to the three by three or not, maybe hold that decision to the end of the meeting once we've determined like what are the other things that we know we want to the three by three to be conscious of their um, their kind of time and effort that they're putting in. And maybe that goes for like, we hold all issue decisions for the three by three to the end of the meeting and kind of staff goes through one by one once we've had a sense of like, where, where do we have more questions? Where do we feel like we wanna dive in in a more meaty way? Um, so definitely not wanted to that, but just a, a suggestion that I think might help me to weigh that. Um, but then listening to this discussion that was just happening and going back to what Kristen had suggested around having like a third designation, like a cultural district, I started thinking about like, what is the value of that? And again, like what are the goals of each of these, these designations? And then thinking in particular, uh, someone had mentioned Red House earlier today and the eviction that's happening right now for the, the illegal eviction that's happening right now for the Kinney family, um, one of the, the last black families uh, living on uh, Albina Avenue or Mississippi uh, in, in Portland. Um, and thinking about what are the ways that like some sort of designation for that house or, or the area it sits in to have protected that, that family more and, and prevented the, the development that is, is displacing them in a really, really terrible and violent way. Um, and thinking about, 
again, what is this idea of an equity lens of what if like on top of the gold, silver and bronze, and this may be kind of our, our final meeting and just telegraphing a next step for the project. But what does it look like to put some equity in terms of how we're defining these protections and then layering on top of that um, additional equity provisions that, that meet the goals of the city around things like right to return or uh, protecting people from displacement. Like I think the, the value to community of a cultural district is not super useful if it's symbolic only. It's useful if it creates stability for a community, if it protects, creates safety for a community in a real way, if it just creates like a mechanism that then we can use in other places of the code to help provide those needs and protections to, to address equity and justice uh, in the city. So I know it's like really late in the game to kind of be like staff come up with an equity lens for everything. But I think flagging that that's something that I think we need to have. And that feels a little bit lacking to me in terms of how we're looking at these designations and how do we really address the equity issue that I think we all really deeply care about. And I'll just respond for the, the good of the discussion that the Red House is in the Mississippi Conservation District. It is a contributing resource. Under these code proposals, it would have demolition review. Under today's regulations, it has demolition delay. I, I agree entirely. And, and I think the question for this commission, especially as you get later into the discussions is, um, that good that direction is that a title 33 is that this code project in title 33 and do we have the tools here or is that the charge for where we go next and i don't have the answer to that today so thanks well i think that in in keeping with moving us on i'm gonna um and jeff helped frame i think in a way i can pose a little more clearly um, i would like to do a straw poll and we can decide three by three later on for oriana's suggestion so i guess first of all is what people think about um supporting staff's recommendation in terms of hand, how to handle national registered districts or landmarks. So this is gonna be a, a raise your hand if you think staff done it the way you think, if you support the way staff's done it. Um, and um, and the op other option is to elevate um, national registered districts to some, op um, to some one of the existing levels or to give them some um, impetus towards picking one later on through a process. So the first question is, do we support staff's recommendation, straw polling for, um, the role of national register districts and landmarks. You can raise your real hands. I think I can see everybody. Okay. And if you, so I'm seeing a so so, I'm seeing one, two, three. Just keep your hands up here. I'm going to try it out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven and a half. Okay. And then people who, I guess you have another half to vote, Oriana, um, for, um, for revisiting how that's handled. Raise your hand for that. I'm seeing one and a half that way. Okay. Or maybe two. Okay. Well, thank you. That's that's what straw polls are for to give an idea of where we're at. Um, and then the other question I have is for the um, the currently kind of three step hierarchy, but mostly historic and conservation districts. Do we want to open the box? Um, maybe consider a third one or shift perhaps the level of protection between those two. Um, that's a question. So I guess I'll put a ask. Do you think that we should um, um, go there? If we do, we probably will need the input from the three by three. Um, so raise your hand if we think we should go there. Raise your hand if we should go with what we have in the staff's proposal on that one. Okay, it looks like staffs were gonna support what's on the books right now for that. Um, so with that, thank you. Um, let's lead us into theme two, or maybe perhaps there's more. I'll let, I'll let Brandon take us next. As with this topic, there's always more. Um, the last proposal under theme one is proposal 1C, remove zoning code provisions pertaining to unranked resources. As a quick reminder, the zoning code includes these undesignated unranked resources in the code language. There is no regulatory uh, consequence of unranked resources being in the code. We're proposing to remove it from the code. No commissioner addressed this as an issue. Any, any interest in this today? I'm seeing a lot of studious people who are not raising their hands. So let's move to the next one. Thanks. Great. So this one um, will be a good one for discussion. Um, we're going to move into theme two. And the first proposed under theme two is to A, establish a new procedure for identifying historical historic resources eligible for designation. This would be the significant resource category. Um, Commissioner Backrack raised an issue uh, pertaining to this uh, proposal, no other commissioner raised an issue. Um, and so Jeff, I'll either let you read it or I'll, I'll read your issue. I'd be happy to. Um, 
maybe I'll, I'll just do that. Um, Jeff uh, raised an issue on the description of significant resources, uh, requesting that we consider adding language to the description in the code um, that pertains to the determination of the significant resource being um, something other than a land use decision and making it eminently clear that a significant resource cannot become a landmark or district without owner consent. But Jeff, I'll let you speak to that in more detail. I believe what I'm proposing is what the code provides for. And I just thought it was important to say it expressly when we talk about significant resources, because we got a bunch of letters from people who were saying, you know, oh my God, I'm in the historic inventory and now you're, you're bumping me up to significant resource. And it's really not a bumping up so much as I understand it, just to be clear, if you're a significant resource, you're on the historic inventory today, we're gonna automatically make you a significant resource, which subjects you to demolition delay and nothing else, correct, Brandon? Yes. And it would be a change in name. So we'd reach change out to something name. rather than moving so, something. Just what I thought it. was important, again, was to add those sentences because that is, in fact, what a significant resource is, correct? It's not a land use decision, and you cannot get bumped higher up without owner consent. It's so, so two things. We, we did meet, and uh, we're on, we have our code editor, Shannon Buno, on the phone, too, and maybe I'll ask Shannon to jump in. But we did talk about this at the staff level. One, <clears throat> um, we believe that, that the staff uh, proposed code does effectively achieve your second point, um, that identification of the significant resource does not um, preclude, or, or how do I want to say, it, it doesn't change the circumstances of owner consent being required to have that property listed as a landmark in the future. That property, whether it's significant resource or not, um, would have the owner be required to provide consent for landmark status. So significant resource listing wouldn't have a bearing on the owner consent requirements of, of landmark listings higher up. Um, but for new significant resources to be identified in the future, these code proposals do require a legislative procedure to do that. So city council in the future would be required to add new significant resources. So if Jeff, let's say, just using an example, your house was documented by city staff and city staff said this, this ought to be considered for significant resource status. Um, city council under these code proposals would be that decision maker. They would be making that decision in a land use context, uh, but that would not prohibit you or change your ability as an owner to say, I refuse a designation in the future. That the significant resource level is below the designation line. Does that clarify? <laughs> uh, my fundamental concern was people are gonna get notified, you are now a significant resource. That, that will be a new label for certain homeowners. And I just wanna be clear in our definition of significant resource, we explain what that means. And so if my description is accurate for, for resources currently on the historic inventory, that's step one. And I think my language is consistent for that purpose. If you're saying the situation changes for future designations of significant resource, then I'm not sure what we, if we need additional language or if we just clarify something's different going forward. So walk me through that again, Brandon. So brand new staff decides you wanna designate my house significant resource. What is that? Can I object? or can I not object, but I can't go any higher up the hierarchy without my consent? Right, so the way that the proposals are organized is that the determination of significant resource is not a designation, that it is eligibility for designation. And with that eligibility for designation does come a 120 day demolition delay period per the state goal five rule. Um, but as an owner, you can participate in that process, but you wouldn't be able to refuse significant resource status. If city staff, city council, the Landmarks Commission said, Jeff, we actually would prefer your house be a historic landmark and not a significant resource, you would be able to refuse that historic landmark status. So, to say, so, so significant resource applies the same whether you're a significant resource currently on the historic inventory or you're gonna be a brand new significant resource. Okay, so I, I think that language applies in both situations. It's clarifying. The designation is not land use because you can't appeal it. You can't prevent it. And you number two, so 
you won't go any higher up the hierarchy without your consent. Number I, two I, is I, correct. I think it's number one, be express. number one, it is a land use. It'd be a legislative procedure, right? So it's not city staff. It's not me or um, Sandra who are adding it to the map ourselves. We would require a legislative procedure. But, but I guess there's a there's a legal distinction you're missing here, Brandon. It's not a legal land use decision. You may want to talk to the city attorney about that. If it's a legal land use decision, I have certain rights. I do not have those land use rights under what you're calling a legislative process. And so I just, anyway, I, I think that what I've written is, is, is what you were saying in the process. And I just want, if, I, if I'm wrong how I'm saying it, I'm, I'm happy to have you or city attorney amend it. But I do think in when our, description of what a significant resource is, I think it's important that the public understand what we've just been talking about. So I'll, I'm done. Sandra or Shannon, I'll, I'll let you pop in as well. Um, and, and Jeff, it, my, my pause isn't so much about the, 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 the core of um, your issue, but about how we implement that and, and whether it's code commentary and how that is written. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause. I think staff certainly have taken this to heart since it's aligned with what we're trying to do. Um, and see if Sandra or Shannon can, as code experts, help me better understand. Welcome, I, I Shannon. Think, thank you very much. Um, I would just add that I, I totally agree uh, with Jeff's wording. It's more um, that we don't have, we don't explain that kind of detail, which is really more about the goal five rules and how you become a significant resource or something else for the other designations. So it sort of begs the question in terms of putting it there in the code language itself for the definition, I think it would be perfectly reasonable to put it in the commentary and tell people that in that way, but put it, we, we just don't put those kinds of steps in the zoning code um, for any kind of goal five resource. Um, and it sort of begs the question why we're not saying for all the other resources when owner consent is allowed or, or required or not allowed. Would so it, that was my hesitation. Would it be a definition? So they are definitions and they are linked. It's the definitions are in 910 and they are almost word for word the same as what's in the description. The historic code, um, you know, the decision was made many years ago to have those words here as well for ease of reading. We don't do the same thing, certainly with like e-zone code or other kinds of things. So it, it's a bit of an anomaly to have them in both places. But and yes, it really right. is the definition. Not the don't, don't we say elsewhere in the code that owner consent is required for historic we, and conservation? We, we certainly do in the parts of the code that tell you what you have to do or what kind of application, you know, where your application requirements are and um, uh, the approval criteria. Sure. So it's there, it's just not all here. In, and I'm so, pointing to that page in the document. Could we, I, I'm imagining that when this project is done, there will be some public facing website or summary for lay readers. Is this something that we could accomplish there? Um, because I, I totally get Jeff's point about wondering, well, oh, these, these, these are new designations. Is it my house or not? You know, what does it mean? Um, and many people with that question won't pull up Title 33 and start reading. Um, they'll go to the city website. So I guess I, I would suggest that perhaps, uh, I'm, I'm not opposed to the ideas that Jeff's thrown out in here because I think the clarity is helpful for me right now. Um, but in terms of the public viewing it, they might not even get to, you know, section 33445040G. So I just want to toss that out as an idea. Yeah, I think both of those commentary and the uh, handout. And the commentary. Okay, you faded out a little bit, Shannon, but I can still see you. Um, well, I guess, um, Jeff, do you think that this is an item to, you want to, you want to pursue? You're welcome to do so. And if so, whether it should go to three by three or you want to work with staff on potential amendment. It doesn't strike me as a three by three. I mean, I think staff is agreeing. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is the fact. Mm -hmm. We're just having a little bit of a nuanced discussion about where does explaining this fact of, about significant resource belong. Okay. 
in, in the chapter 33, in a commentary in some place, and I guess I'm open to wherever it goes. I just want to be sure there's a clear marker put down. I wouldn't want to be two, three years from now, someone tries to change that. And if it's only a commentary, it becomes a lot easier to change versus it's in the code. You do not go up the hierarchy from significant resource unless you consent. I think that'll give a lot of people a comfort level. And the more expressly we state it and the more clearly it's stated in the code, I think the better, but it's, uh, yeah, I think the important thing it's said, so. Great. Um, I, I mean, I would have to say if we did a pro project, which I hope we do in the future to inventory other parts of the city that haven't been inventoried in the past, we will not be in our public information, pointing people to the zoning code, right? We would have a staff report like we do for this project. We would have frequently asked questions, which would include the types of details I think that Jeff, you're, you're suggesting we put in the code. So I'm just kind of like, maybe, maybe um, Shannon and Brandon and I can think about it and work with you, Jeff, offline. Sure. Why, and then why don't we take it offline and not bog down our process? Yeah, why don't we do that? Because we're in, a, we're in agreement. What you're saying is true. It's just okay. whether the language yeah. I, I agree. It's probably not worth bogging down. Unless anyone else wants to join in an offline discussion. Okay, great. Um, um, ben, do you want to chime in on this? Yeah, I think at this point, I think we, we we figured out what's probably the most appropriate route for this discussion. I guess my, my only point is, I think that the issue that Jeff raises is, is, is well taken and that in first place, that's the reason why, you know, people are sometimes feeling they're forced to hire people like him that, that know the code and, you know, they're land use experts because those type of, that type of clarity doesn't come through to the layperson. So whatever we can do to the extent that we can provide that clarity. And so I I, I think look forward to see what Sandra and others and, and Jeff come up with. Uh, that would be appreciated. Sounds good. Well, Brandon, please lead us on. Sounds great. I, Jeff, we'll, I'll give you a ring. We'll, we'll see if we can bring forward a, a technical amendment and get this right. So moving on, and this one we're going to have um, some healthy discussion today, I think. Um, we're going to move on to proposal 2B. This is the last one that staff have for discussion today at the work session. Um, 2B is to revise the criteria and procedures for locally designating, amending, and removing landmark and district status. And so we're going to think back to the hierarchy. Um, and this is about how do things end up on the hierarchy? How do things come off of that hierarchy? And how do things move up and down the hierarchy? In these code amendments, we don't have the ability to affect whether or not a property or district is listed in or removed from the National Register of Historic Places. And so here in today's discussion, uh, we don't get to set the criteria or process for National Register listing, but what we do have control over are the criteria, procedures, um, application requirements, and the review bodies for adding, removing, and moving things up and down at the historic and conservation level. Um, we do have seven issues raised by PSC members. Um, Historic Landmarks Commission and their testimony earlier had, had quite a few items on this one. So I know um, Chair Miner here today probably will uh, enhance our discussion, um, but I think we will uh, take these in the order they were received. And, and we're really thinking about how districts are designated and how the designation is removed. And um, if I may, I, I uh, would, would start us off with number one in the comments from commissioners. I suspect this is going to be a little bit of a fluid discussion to work our way through. Um, but at least starting off with um, Commissioner Backrack had an item that was raised regarding um, owner consent for contributing structures. This is a more of a potentially a technical amendment. I uh, would like to hear a little more from Commissioner Backrack and, and the, the comment was amend owner consent provision for contributing structures amend the code to provide for the owner of a contributing resource in any type of district who objected when the district was created or amended. So Jeff would be interested in hearing that. This is thinking about how things are removed from. You know, I, I, for one minute, um, the code, the, if you're trying to follow the code, it, it's 33846-040. Um, Page 195. 195? 195 of volume two. And this was really a kind of a throw out there one, and it may not be worth taking much of the commission's time on it. 
I was trying to understand, there's a provision about owner consent that you can remove a contributing structure if there's owner consent. And it says the property owner at the time of the designation must have objected on the record. Uh, and I was trying to have the same concept apply in a district. What this now says is that you could change a historic or conservation district if 51% of the owners at the time of the designation objected. Well, of course, if 51% of the owners objected, it wouldn't be a district. So I was trying to figure out, well, what, suppose I object, I'm a contributing structure in a city designated district and I objected at the time. I not only objected to the creation of the district, I objected to my house being a contributing structure. So if we're saying owner consent is now grounds for removing a contributing structure, should, if I can show I objected at the time, shouldn't that qualify for me? I mean, or do I have to go round up 51% of my neighbors? I guess I didn't understand how this 51% worked. And I also thought that shouldn't it apply to an individual who objected to their house being a contributing structure when Laurelhurst was created. Because today you couldn't do that without my consent, I don't believe. So I, I was sort of confused about how this worked and that's why I threw a, a suggestion to address it. Uh, if I objected at the time of the creation of a district, what do I have some rights under this removal? Anyone wanna jump in? That's a great question. If, if you if you you come the short end of the stick in voting to create a district, but your house is identified as a contributing resource, um, does it get afforded the protections of a contributing resource, even over your objection? Is kind of the question I think I'm hearing from Jeff. I guess I'm just confused about how this whole section works, quite frankly. All right, maybe as staff, I'll I'll provide some background on this. Um, one, as I mentioned. Our, our code does not have the ability to supersede the National Register. And so if a, if a district is listed on the National Register and a building or buildings are identified as contributing, our local code does not have the ability to amend that National Register listing. And so that's, that's one. Two. Now, can I clarify, the National Register listing includes identification of contributing structures in the listing? It does. Okay. It does. Two, Oregon in 1995 adopted unique in the country owner consent law. And when that owner consent law was adopted into statute, it did not provide specificity on how to handle districts. So the language of the consent law is an owner may refuse a historic designation. Since 1995, um, Portland has not created at the local level through a legislative procedure, a new conservation or historic district. Part of the reason why the automatic identification as historic district or conservation district has been in the code was as a, um, let's call it a, a roundabout way to have new historic districts come out of National Register listings. When the new state goal five rule was adopted in 2017, Land Conservation Development Commission sought to provide local governments clarity on how new districts are created and how owner consent is tabulated at the local level. When the new rule was adopted, the decision was that an affirmative 50% plus one owner consent would be required to create at the local level, a new historic district. And so as we've worked through these code amendments, we followed that definition of owner consent as it's provided in the goal five rule, which says an owner is an affirmative 51% of owners, whether it's a condo association, whether it's property owners in a district, uh, whether it's a family who has three family members who disagree. And so we've tracked with that 51, 50 plus 1% affirmative consent requirement in the affirmative for listing. And we've tracked with that for removal of district status that if let's say there were one of our districts that was designated by the city previous 1995 and a majority of those owners objected, these code amendments would allow that district to be dissolved in its entirety if we went to the record and found a majority of owners historically had objected. Uh, what we have not proposed in these code amendments is a Swiss cheese approach to districts where a future district or a past district would allow for owners based upon whether they support or not being in the district to come in or out, that it would be in, let's say an all or nothing proposition. 
to my knowledge, there's no other piece of Oregon's land use system that requires this type of affirmative owner consent to make a legislative land use decision. Okay. I'm, any other comments on this before I throw one more little question? I'm still not totally, so you could live in a house that's a contributing structure and you would have no say on whether it gets elevated to that status if the district is so designated. That's what I'm trying to get my head around. A new district. Yes. Correct. So the way these code amendments are drafted, if 51% plus one of your neighbors said they supported the district and through a legislative procedure, city council so designated the district, then you as an owner would be subject to the rules of that district under these code proposals. Okay. And you're also subject to the inventory of that district. That, that either designated your structure as contributing versus not contributing. You don't get to question that. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. Right, Brandon? That can change quasi-judicially over time. So these code proposals do provide a path. So let's say you were identified as a contributing building, you objected, the district gets created, you come back in quasi-judicially saying, I really, my building for this reason or that reason, based upon substantive evidence should not be contributing. There is a path for that that doesn't exist today. So what we see in conservation districts today, there's no quasi-judicial path for an owner to come off based upon the alterations of their property or fire or... So there is over time the opportunity for the contributing um, structures in a district to change and become out of sync with the original federal designation that maybe got up there in the first place? Um, there's the process at both the Fed level and in these code amendments, there would be a process at the local level for an owner to seek removal, but it would be based upon substantive evidence of making a, have, having a strong case for removal, not the whims of an owner by and of itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm gonna put it to my commissioners. Is this something we want to dig in further? Um, it helps me to understand a little bit better. Um, I'll, I'll look, look for any input. I will say I'll withdraw my suggestion. I think it's a hyper-technical point that's probably Unless anyone else wants to pick up on it, which I'd be happy to go forward with it, but I, I have a feeling it's a little too uh, too micro to bog us down with, quite frankly. Okay. Um, anyone else? All right. I would say that it's an interesting topic, but for me, it would be delegating to three by three, and I'm suspecting that three by three has enough. We'll have enough to wrestle with. So um, I'll move us on to the next one. Great, so next one is a, a, a longer comment from Commissioner Bordalazzo. Um, I think this may be big picture discussed and um, Commissioner Bordalazzo is uh, concerned that the staff report does not specifically call out the use of district designation as a vehicle for making the construction of needed housing more expensive and difficult. What should district designation be reserved for? How should that balance be struck at the district level between history and contemporary needs? How can we raise the bar on district designation to avoid seeing our desire to honor history being co-opted by pa patriarchal or parochial perspectives on just what that history actually is. So a lot of really good discussion topics here for today. Um, in this comment, there was no code citation, but I think it's a good one for us to talk about in the, the context of how districts get designated and how they may get reevaluated. Well, we don't have to be waited to codes to have a discussion. Does anyone want to chime in on this? Follow this thread? Well, if I may, just uh, to provide a little bit more context. Um, um, this is kind of challenging, um, like Brandon rightfully said, I, th I think a broader discussion and uh, some concerns that I personally have, but also I heard, you know, over the years uh, with different proposals and designations um, and, and different efforts in different places that, that kind of were raised and, and, and essentially is, is that a, a more or less overt way to essentially avoid change? Um, and if that's the case, are we clear about uh, where, what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to protect? And are we precluding access to, uh, you know, highly amenitized neighborhoods to uh, uh, segments of the population that need it the most? So I guess that's that's really the 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 big picture. It's um, question in my mind. All right. Any other thoughts on that? And we're balancing goal five with many other goals in our community. Um, I got Steph and then Kristen. So Steph. All I got, it's quick. Uh, 
I'm 100% yes. I've been thinking about this a lot too. Thank you. Okay, I'm Kristen. I think this is an ideal topic for the three by three discussion group. And, and the reason is um, that, you know, as a, as a commission, my commission, we've been so um, committed, I guess, in the last couple of years of finding ways to really uh, flip the narrative from historic districts or from historic designation always being about those you know, sort of white, wealthy, et cetera, groups, and instead to really advocate for a different reading. But we also are very cognizant of the fact that all districts have to change, um, and, and that's at every level. You know, it's just sort of the, the amount of change and how that change happens that we need to sort of decide together. And I, I absolutely think that um, we, we need to define that. So, you know, it's, it's not a quick, you know, it's not a sort of quick code fix here, but it's worthy of some real discussion. So that's Thank you. the beginning of that. <laughs> well, I'm gonna Oriana, then I'm gonna jump in and then, um, I, Jeff, is that a quickie on just this item? Uh, I don't know if it's a quickie, I'll try to be quick. <laughs> Well, I think I'm going to go to Oriana next and then go, 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 go. Oriana. I'll wait my turn. <laughs> yeah, I just want to express really strong support and gratitude uh, to Ben for, for including this piece. I actually wonder if it couldn't go a little bit further rather than just naming that the staff language, uh, naming that um, it's more expensive to construct a house, that it makes housing and contemporary need harder, but talk a little bit more broadly about benefits and burdens. I think the staff report does a good job of addressing kind of the historic uh, racism that we have in planning, um, the, the kind of problems of the historic districts in that context. But I think it could be really strong language of just reminding like when we really value certain history and certain buildings, we're valuing a very specific history. And when we put that over contemporary need, we are potentially undervaluing in particular BIPOC communities or people who might live in, in multifamily housing. Um, so I, I think we might wanna massage that language a little bit, but I don't know from, from my perspective that it necessarily needs to go to, to the, the three by three for further discussion if we all kind of feel moved to, to move in this direction and just be really explicit about the, what is weighted in these decisions. Thank you. Um, I'll chime in and then I'll go to Jeff. I, I totally agree and thanks for bringing this up, Ben. And I think if it's part of the three by three, that's great to pre it, but I think we'll wanna have all of us talk about it also. Um, and, and I hope that, and I think this is probably consistent with what Kristen was saying is that we're not just flipping the narrative, we're flipping the reality, I think, of what's actually on the ground for historic preservation. Um, because I think it's an important role for the city to have and important changes I think should happen to it. Um, in the code, um, and that's a future code project. This one's getting more structural. Um, so I'm gonna pass it on to Jeff and then to Kat. Yeah, again, thank you, Ben and everybody else. I think we're more or less on the same wavelength. I, I would focus our concern on the large residential districts, Laurelhurst, upcoming Eastmoreland, wherever they are, where I think we're all a little uncomfortable that 51% of the homeowners in these neighborhoods were, were able to kind of create their own protected neighborhoods. And I think the way to get at that in those districts in particular is just to, 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 to lower some of the regulations, to, to make sure RIP, for example, will work in those neighborhoods. And uh, the historic designation, designation doesn't become an impediment to achieving the goals of RIP. And I think if that's a direction we can do by looking at some of the regulations and going, you know what, it's a balance between historic preservation and creating a good opportunity for more infill. I just think we should err on the side of the regulations that allow for RIP. And the, again, these are large residential districts. And I think they're, they're a little different than the more specifically tailored you know, commercial historic districts. So that, that, that's the focus I would take in response to Ben's concern. Thanks, Kat. Oh, I was just going to add, just as a, a to follow up on, I believe it was Oriana's comment, just about maybe this doesn't merit a three by three. I think the fact that 
um, Kristen's commission is very um, interested in this topic. Maybe it's not necessarily something we're trying to come to compromise on, but more it's just how we're how we're working together to to have make sure it's a much more cohesive and rich response is really important. So I would say it should be a three by three topic. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Steph. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm of the, similarly, like, I think it's, this is one of those that's big enough that I would hope that it would permeate all of our conversations. <laughs> so, including in the three by three. Um, thank you. Um, so I think we've got some guidance for the three by three. Kristen, do you want to jump in or? I, I do want to say briefly um, that I would suggest some of you actually read a historic district nomination. And I'll, I'll just suggest the one that I wrote relatively recently ago, which was Laurel Hurst. And, you know, there's some pretty interesting things in that district nomination. It's, you know, it's, yeah, it's, you know, it's, probably 60 pages worth of reading material. So, you know, if you're, if you're bored, but it also really illuminates um, some facets of our society. I mean, we, we need these stories, you know, so that's part of the reason why anything is a historic district. So without going down that road too far, um, I also wanted to bring up a point about something I hear a lot of you are saying about, you know, there's, there's sort of other criteria being, you know, being brought in here and that's that greater good criteria, right? I, I think we actually need um, to bring that specifically into the code. So I would, I would definitely encourage us to look at the approval criteria for designation, which are in 846.030 and actually identify some, you know, equity goals from, you know, the comp plan chapter two, climate goals, um, density and housing goals. You know, these are things that as a city, we get to bring to bear on our city designations that the national register isn't ever going to take into account. So this is our opportunity to do that. Thank you. Um... Kat or Jeff, are your hands still up or do you have new times? Okay. Chair Spirak, if, if I may, one, one thing I think could be helpful, if, whether this goes to the three by three or not. Since 1996, Portland's experience with designation of resources has by and large been through the National Register. Uh, we've seen only a very small handful of property owners, individual owners who are self-selecting to become local historic conservation landmarks because the National Register has been um, a familiar tool because we have, um, we've had historically a variety of state and federal financial incentives that are available to National Register owners. Um, and it's been a relatively efficient way to add populate our historic landmark and district list. And so our, our, our last 25 years of experience has been in the National Register process. And as a staff person who gets the privilege of bringing National Register nominations to the Landmarks Commission for their advisory review and recommendation to the Park Service, the Landmarks Commission has uh, excellent discussions around the quality of the material it submitted, the citations, whether or not an applicant for National Register listing is missing a part of the story. Uh, recently, former uh, Landmarks Commissioner Spears and, and Chair Miner had a, had a great discussion about the Patton home in North Portland and whether or not there was a part of the history specifically dealing with uh, BIPOC uh, populations who were living in that building, whether that was um, needed to be better explained in the nomination. So there's this great discussion at the Landmarks commission level about the history, the importance, the context. But what has been absent from that discussion in every single National Register nomination that's been processed by the commission in the last 25 years is the regulatory consequences of listing. Because the Landmarks Commission's only charge with National Register reviews is, should this be listed on the National Register? It's not been, is it appropriate to add historic resource review? Would community design standards be a better protection? Should there be design guidelines at the time of listing? And that's been, and, and while there's like minds who disagree and a lot of testimony about this, at the staff level, um, for me, one of the most compelling reasons for us to have a strong local designation conversation whenever we do apply regulation to a site, since it's absent from that national register discussion. It's not our, not our, not our program and the Fed say, um, you know, they're not all that interested in the regulatory consequences here locally. So I guess I would just add that as background context that 
whether it's the three by three or the full group or both, um, you do get to, um, let's say, choose your own adventure a bit here about how you arrive at what's the right approach, process, criteria when we do choose to designate and protect something since the, the protection piece has been absent in the conversation for a long time. Thank you. Um, Steph. Sorry, I feel like I'm just, you know, popcorning in a lot. Um, uh, one, I appreciate you, Kristen. I, uh, I had the joy for a few months as an, basically an intern at BPS of reading a whole bunch of nomination forms when we were mapping out the, the inventory. So um, definitely a plus one. Um, they're, they're all great reads. They're all like little love letters <laughs> to specific spaces. Um, and I, I don't know if this is the space to do it, um, but I wanna unburden myself with uh, or disclose. One thing that I heard in a lot of the testimony is uh, to be honest, um, a, a sense of like that historic preservation um, having some synonymous relationship among neighborhoods with specialness. And um, growing up in East Portland, living in East Portland, you know, of the 725 designations, 726 uh, now uh, designations, um, only one of those is east of 205. And, um, and so what, when I see something like a, an entire district and I look at our housing goals, and I really, again, appreciate Ben, you bringing this up for a larger conversation so I can invert myself thus, uh, that I, I hear again, and again, I heard this in, in some of the testimony, um, kind of like preserve our specialness, put the density in East Portland. And like everyone, everyone is the hero of their own story. Every neighborhood is special to them. Everyone has the history of their own lived experience and their own connections. And, um, and so when, when, I, when we are talking about uh, historic districts, something that is larger scale, uh, that impacts on a mapping level, what our affordable housing inventory, our, 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 our housing goals, our other goals, um, I think of where are those goals going to go and what does that mean? And how are we preserving the specialness and um, and again contributing to a sense of belonging uh, among more communities? So, thank you. Thank you, Seth. Oriana. Yeah, I just want to first apologize to Kristen if my comment about the three by three, I was not being as conscious of the fact that it is two bodies coming together there and just kind of thinking from the, the dialogue on the PSC. So my apologies if I, I caused any offense. Uh, but I did want to kind of latch on to what you said about the designation review language and that purpose and kind of setting climate or, or equity goals. In general, I'm very supportive of that in theory, but also a little concerned. I think more and more, especially with equity and climate, we're naming those as important things and then not building it significantly enough into the actual language that we're working with. We're saying it's a goal, but it's not necessarily reflected in process or, or impact. And I, I hope that that would be reflected in some of our additional conversations as well. Again, kind of going back to this equity lens. If we name equity as part of the purpose and when it's named and ensuring underrepresented histories are recognized and protected, but if we went further or we added a, a climate goal, and we'll talk more, I know in a couple of weeks uh, about the, the kind of solar and seismic and energy efficiency benefits as well, then I think we really have to make sure that we're, we're really living that through in each, in each action that we take here and really setting the Historic Landmarks Commission up to be able to meet those goals and not just have them be a name only and cause frustration with, with community when those goals can't be met necessarily because the nature of the thing doesn't, doesn't comport with that. So I just want us to be, to be conscious if we're aspirational in goals to also be aspirational in, in our process and in our language and be consistent in that regard. Thanks, Kat. So this great three by three topic, I'm intrigued by a couple things I'm hearing. Um, and Oriana, you you positively got my wheels spinning. And I guess so. There's a couple things I've heard, and I do think that's true. You know, we're we're talking about a lot of 
weighing a lot of the regulatory consequences of what it means to be a district. And I'm going to talk yeah, very specifically with regards to districts as we have been. Um, and the and and I know this is jumping ahead to other topics, but I've certainly been voiced by many people of, of the body that needs to be recommending to council. And so all of all of the goals that we're talking about today that are important to us today are stated in the comp plan. And I guess I'm a little bit worried, just this is where my head's spinning, like if we're gonna name it, and I agree with the importance of what you just said here, Oriana, um, then it's 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 the it, it's where we're at today, but it might not be where we're at 20 years from now, right? And so, like thinking of long term, and if we're tying it to the comp plan, then maybe as the comp plan gets updated and that work ties in through, like, is there a th what I'm trying to guess? I'm saying is is there a thread to saying it's a comp plan work that has to come and be overlaid on the districts? Um, and again, then going back to kind of, I'm jumping ahead, I know, but to then what body is recommending to council, it goes back to that's the work we're all steeped in doing. And um, therefore it's it's somehow taking what you were saying there, Oriana, about how to specifically do the work about climate change and equity and all this in relationship to districts. And I don't have the answer. Like, I think that's a really complex, interesting conversation about how to put some kind of specific, I don't know whether it's metrics or, or criteria to it, but um, it's just where my head's at, for whatever that's worth. Yeah, um, Oriana. Yeah, I'll just build on that a little bit because I, I like where you're going, Kat, of if like we have a climate goal for districts, it shouldn't just be part of the review process of what's to come, but really looking at kind of what we already have in place. Um, and, and some metric would be important or, or equity in terms of how we're, how we're valuing history. And I think that kind of climate issue is one that really gets at the tension Ben was was kind of capturing of kind of contemporary versus historic value of the testimony we've heard of people telling us um, that, you know, uh, a historic home is the greenest home and other folks talking about like the value of multifamily homes and kind of like that, that disconnect that sometimes comes up in terms of like who is best meeting a, a goal and through through what through what means so I don't know that I'm like getting anywhere with this, just building off of that more than it feels like there's a there there. Again, if we put it in the statement, then it can't just be about everything that comes. We have to be able to kind of back apply it in terms of evaluation of, of what we expect from a historic district. And if we do have a climate goal or an equity goal, how is that being weighed against, you know, what happened? And again, coming back to Brandon's comment about like the last 10 years, having the four landmarks that are important to black communities being designated like that lack of time, again, like if we're, we're only applying it to what happens in the future, that's not necessarily equitable because everybody who's come in before has not had to adhere to those goals. So I wanna make sure that we're not just conscious of that, that aspirational and then being consistent in the code language we write, but then also kind of backfilling that, that expectation in a meaningful way. Yeah, makes sense. Oh, thanks. Um, other thoughts on, on this one, as staff, I just wanted to say it was on our mind and we wrote the, the discussion draft or heard the, you know, heard feedback in the concept report, heard feedback in the discussion draft, have heard feedback now is if, if designation was purely honorific, if it was just a plaque, that would convey the public's values, that would convey importance, it would have meaning. But because what we're talking about is zoning code, we're talking about the regulations, at the time of designation is really this great opportunity to weave competing interests together. And when you think about a legislative land use procedure resulting in the creation of a new conservation district or maybe elevating a national registered district to a historic district level, in that same moment is also the opportunity to evaluate the zoning, evaluate the design standards or design guidelines that might apply to the place, evaluate whether or not there's other overlapping programs that would make sense. So I think one of the, one of the great pieces of the richness of this conversation is unlike the circumstance we've had for the last 25 years where the National Register automatically conveyed historic district status and historic resource review and that was it. Every time a new district is designated legislatively, there is that opportunity to get it right. And it may be that in a place like Peacock Lane, which recently went on the National Register as a very small district, um, that is an area where we make an energy sacrifice by elevating it to conservation district and recognizing that every December we blow a lot of energy for that. 
But then there may be other areas where we're intentionally applying different design standards to ensure that communities of color who live in a specific geography have access to opportunity and wealth that maybe we haven't applied in other conservation districts. So I guess one thing I'll just say as staff is, I think too, as you think about creation and, and amendment of districts as a wraparound opportunity um, to get things right in that place from the get-go that we haven't necessarily done through the National Register alone. I'm feeling very inspired. We can do something great. So I guess we will, um, I think there's a lot of interest in this. Um, we'll get the three by three to do some pre-thinking and, um, and think about the future of the historic preservation apparatus and plan. Um, looking back also, not just looking forward. And um, so um, does anyone have someone, everyone raise your hand if you think that's a general good three by three topic. Okay, I'm seeing some pretty good consensus there. Thank you. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. Um, next one, I think this fits similarly. Um, uh, issue from Commissioner Bordalazzo statement about quote overrepresentation being a reason for removal of landmarks and districts it should be an additive approach focusing on adding resources that are underrepresented i think this is related to what we were just talking about but i would um, defer to ben to add any more context on that yeah i think this is uh another one another case where um the the landmark commission comment made a lot of sense to me and I think it's, I, I see the logic rather than uh, removing resources that had already gone through a process and, and demonstrated some value. It didn't make sense to me to use criteria to remove them just because they were overrepresented. I would look at it as in a positive kind of additive way where you add more resources moving forward that are underrepresented moving forward. Uh, it seems like a more positive approach and an approach that kind of acknowledges, you know, uh, what's been done, the work that's been done in the past, and then it kind of has a, a, a different set of criteria and priorities moving forward. Thank you. Um, Mike, do you have a thought on that? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that approach. Should be additive. Okay. Um. I would say I generally agree with that approach. At the same time, I do think the ability to, as as Brandon has described, to be able to use the tiers and and have that conversation um, at a larger community level is important. And if you're only doing additive and you're already at the top of the list, there's no larger conversation to be had about something. So I guess I'm a little bit concerned about that. I, and I'm not saying this at this point in time, this is the project to be adding or removing or doing anything. This is just a project to talk about how those discussions should happen in the future. I've already made it clear that I that's my opinion on how this project needs to be approached. But um, I think the ability to have those discussions and have a meaningful discussion that actually has consequences uh, needs to be, or should be preserved. Um, I'll chime in. I, 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 I'm agreeing with Kat to not try and handle this in this project. I think that I like to focus on the additive piece, but I'm also aware that staff time gets spread across the whole historic resources program. And if staff time is being absorbed heavily by some areas of the city, um, they may not have sufficient resources to actually work with some communities whose stories have not been told yet. Um, and while we're operating from a scarcity model and that, and Brandon is here to illustrate one person, you know, staffing this program, um, we do have a scarcity situation. So I think that um, it is worth thinking through um, in order to come up with the energy as a city to add new areas, which I'm ex that's the thing most exciting to me. Um, I think that we should be honest with ourselves about what, citywide resources go into um, protections, phone calls, all the work it takes to maintain the apparatus for some of the pretty large areas we've already designated for protection. So I, as I will say, I'm not proposing this for this code update, but um, I think that I'd like to see that conversation go forward and to acknowledge that some of these, we still have some discrepancies between, um, you know, how so some of the walkable areas within walking distance of downtown or residential neighborhoods um, that have some, some limits on how much you can build there. And so there are some competing goals that as our city grows going forward, you know, 50 years, um, will we be able to have these large geographic areas that you um, are, are pretty limited what can be what can be done there. Um, I, think that, I think there's some long-term balancing to go there. 
Um, so I will switch over to Mike, and then I think we'll probably kick to the next item. Thanks. Yeah, having worked on goal five issues for 38, 39 years, how long has it been? Um, in the natural resource realm, the fact of the matter is the city of Portland has uh, tackled that um, area by area within the city. So I think, I think having the additive um, approach, but prioritizing some geographic areas which are underrepresented, I think may be the way to go. So that, and I absolutely agree with you. Um, I would have preferred we deal with the entire city at one time, but again, their staff resources are limited um, and actually the ability for the public to be engaged is limited. So I, I, I like the idea of prioritizing underrepresented geographic areas, but not necessarily going back and well, removing um, other sites. Thank you. And the size of our city has changed too over time. Um, and maybe we'll continue to. So I'm gonna switch, go to the next one here, if that's all right. Um, do you want me to just describe it? It's, it's one of the ones that I tossed into the mix. Um, sure, sure, feedback, that sounds great. Okay, I mean, I, I've been trying to think of some middle ground positions because a lot of discussion about which commission recommends for the creation of districts. And um, one idea I just wanna thought I'd toss out there and you guys can decide if it's worth exploring further is that one of the, um, when you create a landmark, you pulled some land out of the developable inventory that you can build by right, um, without the, the gold level, the historic level. Um, and um, so that's a balancing of goals. And I think the PSE is an appropriate body for that. However, if you create five landmarks, you know that may be the equivalent, that may be pulling just as little out of the resource, uh, sorry, if you create five landmarks, maybe pulling just as little property out of the developable inventory as if you build one block or one block face. Um, it's not a small district doesn't have that much of an impact any different than a several historic landmark buildings. So I just wanted to toss it out there that there might be room to say that in the purview, um, the Landmarks Commission could take on things like, you know, Peacock Lane or, or some other small districts um, that would not necessarily have to go through the PSC. So I just wanted to float that idea out there and see what people think of it. Um, Kat. I'm generally supportive of the concept where I'm a little bit concerned, and I think it depends on where we go, is what the conversation Oriana and I and others and Kristen even were just kind of having a little bit ago of this overlay of perhaps these other criteria when thinking about districts. And it's, you know, to, to the comment of Peacock Lane and energy uses you know, you're gonna let that go because that's what makes Peacock Lane so special uh, at certain times of year, right? Things like that. And again, those go back to comp plan issues, which goes back to PSC. Mm -hmm. um, it, um, there's no doubt in my mind, Historic Landmarks Commission plays a critical role in helping the PSC understand the historic value of a district or not, right? Whatever that conversation is, we need their expertise, but I think there's an expertise on another level. And I don't, so I don't know what the right, I don't know the right balance there, Eli. And I'm intrigued by the notion of, of what you just brought up, but also a little bit, not sure where the conversation is go about the other criteria. So I think it might just need to play itself out a little bit. Okay, um, Kristen. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate that suggestion um, because I think it does recognize the, the, you know, the kind of different expertise that both of our commissions bring to the table. Um, I, I do have some concerns with it because it starts to um, it starts to create these districts out there that are based on a specific boundary. Um, and, you know, if you don't mind, I'm going to take just a minute and sort of walk you through the, you know, from the historic uh, perspective, why a boundary is really important to a district. You know, it's not just sort of a collection of resources. A boundary really reflects sort of a common story that those, you know, those houses maybe or other structures have in common. And so, I guess what I would counter with Eli is maybe there is a sort of smaller 
district, but it's not really based on size of the boundary. Maybe it's based on the number of contributing properties or something, because then, you know, we wouldn't see, you know, districts sort of driving for that just under the mark, you know, um, but instead be formed around actual, you know, boundaries based on historic evidence and contemporary, um, you know, what's really on the ground. Um, I, I do think that the HLC is the right body when it comes to decisions based on integrity and significance um, and um, rarity. Um, you know, we, there's a whole comparative element, you know, that goes into these decisions. But I also agree that, you know, if we're going to add in more sort of comp plan based criteria, which I think is a good idea, um, then there's absolutely a role for, you know, our commissions to sort of figure out, you know, where is that level and, you know, how does it work? Um, so I think that's worthy of discussion. Hey, any other comments? Oh, Kat, yeah. I'll, I'll just make this real quick and because I want to make sure Kristen, you and your entire commission understands. I completely agree with what you said. Like all those all those criteria that are historic criteria, we are not the body to be talking about that. And I would say no matter how this gets set up, I have a hard time imagining the PSC, if, it, if it's going to go through the PSC, would ever recommend a district get approved if you guys feel it doesn't meet the criteria. Right? I mean, I think that's I think, and I, maybe we need to codify that. I don't know, right? Like maybe there's even a, some type of relationship of how the steps of a district get created. And again, if you guys are going to say it doesn't meet the criteria, then it, it shouldn't. We shouldn't be talking about it at the PSC level. That's for sure, right? So um, I think there's some. Like I think we could kind of come together and find some creative ways to kind of talk about what what that looks like and how that works in tandem as a as the two commissions working together. Um, and maybe there's even codification of the requirement of the two commissions working together. You know, I don't know, but I think it, it could be interesting. Okay. And Mike? Yeah, I'll just repeat what I've said before. Um, um, I, I really appreciate our working with the design commission. And, and likewise, I, I really think that we need joint, joint hearings and, and need to pay attention, obviously, to. Uh, to what the historic commission's recommendations are. It should be definitely a joint effort. Thanks. Um, Katie. Yeah, listening to the discussion, um, it seemed like the jumping off spot was the number four, um, thinking about small districts, but even the answer that Kristen gave was, was complex. And so I, I think that the better idea was that how do we how do we route things and how do we work together as, a, as the two commissions? So okay. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't thinking that they would do small districts and we would do large districts. Yeah. Oriana? I like where you're, you're going, uh, Kat, um, and thinking about kind of the way that, um, sorry, I just lost my chance out there, but anyway, um, I'm just thinking about the, the interaction between the two bodies. I wonder if rather than creating like a small district and focusing on size and hearing kind of what you were saying, Kristen, about kind of like that, that boundary issue, if maybe there was like from a criteria perspective, like uh, the, the Historic Landmarks Commission has authority to, to establish a landmark or a district if it meets certain criteria. And again, like that equity lens or that, that fast tracking um, and that's that's kind of more binding that it still may have to go through PSC to address the the impacts on the code side, um, but but yeah, just thinking through is there is there a way that we can create like a fast track not just around equity but maybe there are other considerations and I'd be curious what the three by three would come up with to think through like how do the two bodies interact but how is there also maybe a little more power afforded to the uh, historic landmarks commission if something is like resoundingly. A uh, historic district, or has like really significant community value, and that there might be value in kind of 
moving the process uh, along a, a little bit more. And I'm just remembering the, the design review um, and design standards interaction a little bit and kind of that, that graph of like different, different levels of review. And I wonder if we don't start to establish that relationship more significantly here. Okay. Well, I will um, not suggest this item for the um, a vote, but consider it as a conversation starter <laughs> of how we um, work with our commissions um, and, and strike the balance between who does the review, whether we you know it's a review body versus the criteria, how, how that plays out, um, which seems like a, a fruitful thing for three by three. Um, let's get to the next one. I think um, Commissioner Smith, your your next one, item five is, is uh, in effect what we've been talking about here. Uh, Commissioner Smith said composition of the Landmarks Commission, uh, which we will come back to later when we get to the proposal theme five and the relative roles of PSC and HLC Commissioner Smith said he thinks he, that the code proposal generally gets it right. Probably worth gaming out how the process for district designation amendment and de-designation would flow. Who initiates what sequence of evaluation recommendation would occur? Yeah, this is very much a piece of what we've just been talking about. Um, and I think you know, the, it was brought up that for the designation of a district, probably the sequence is it starts at HLC and only if there's a positive recommendation does it go on to PSC. Um, the specific case I want to call out to integrate the discussion we've just been having is if we ever have a proposal for de-designation of a district, uh, how would that flow? And um, yeah, I think I'm in agreement that you know PSC should stay the recommending body to city council because uh, we have the perspective to integrate all the comp plan uh, priorities. But clearly, we'd want to be strongly informed by the HLC's evaluation of the, you know, the value of the resources that are being discussed. We don't have the expertise to evaluate that in detail. So I wonder if we need some specific language that says, you know, it goes to HLC first for, you know, uh, an assessment of the, the value of the resources that are being proposed for de-designation and then it goes on to PSC. You just need to make that clearer. And, you know, this clearly fits into the whole discussion we've just been having about processes. And, um, so I would, I would say just let's tack on that specific use case to what we've been talking about as we send it to the three by three. Okay. So should we go to the next one? Or Kristen, you wanna jump in? Sorry, I just had one more quick point, I guess, about that, which is that um, the Landmarks Commission is really concerned that the um, the the amount of procedure that it might take is really an equity issue in and of itself. And I, and I just wanna make that really clear and that maybe there are ways that we can reduce that or work on that or you know, give help to certain groups. But um, what I see right now shaping up as our new procedure for you know, any small neighborhood that, you know, I mean, for any reason who wants to become a city, you know, a city conservation district or whatever, it's just going to be so hard for them to do that, um, to go through all of these levels and procedures, you know, and that's not even the work itself, you know, which is sort of to get there, you always need to sort of do that survey. And I know that, you know, BPS and, you know, maybe to some degree even BDS, um, is going to, you know, we're going to think about that as part of future work, like how does, you know, BDS really sort of commit to doing some survey work every year, but creation of a district and how do we make that more accessible? I, I want that to be a topic if possible. Thank you. And I guess I want to, as part of that, um, and maybe Kristen, later on, you can, you, you can share um, how much of that high bar is the National Historic, the National Register, which has been the historic path. If you didn't have to do that at all, which you wouldn't have to under this proposal, I guess I'd be interested in knowing how that changes the level of work. Because we're so used to thinking you have to go through the whole national process. I guess the question back to you, and I, I think I probably should let Oriana speak next, but is what if you didn't have to do that? Um, so Oriana, go next, and then we can circle back if you want. Yeah, so I'm going to more or less say what I just said, but maybe a little bit more coherently this time. And I'm, I'm weeding or kind of bringing it back to that uh, discussion we were starting to have around climate and equity 
goals. And Kat had kind of mentioned uh, the idea of metrics. And I built off that a little bit. I drew a little diagram, which I think I would hold up to my screen, but it's probably not going to work well. But the idea of being a base of the Historic Landmarks Commission, and then two tracks. One uh, that is uh, qualifiable by like certain scoring uh, from an equity and or climate person in the neighborhood. So that there's a way to qualify and avoid the PSC, but it requires you know, meeting kind of comp plan goals that we have or equity or climate metrics. And for entities that don't meet that criteria, that don't get through that fast track, they're then sent to the PSC to kind of consider more deeply or, or understand um, and follow most of the time as Kat suggested, I would imagine the recommendation from the Historic Landmarks Commission. But if there's some concern about, you know, this is a district that, that isn't meeting climate goals, or this is a district that has concerns around equity goals and thinking about some of the, the districts that may be in the pipeline right now that folks have concerns about, like that's a way to provide further consideration, but then it's easier for in particular, like a black community in East Portland that wants to, to preserve some part of their history and community but then it's much easier and doesn't involve that layer. Because I hear what you're saying, Kristen, about like the more procedure you put in, and this came up in the design um, in Doza conversations as well, that well, that when you add a lot of procedure, it adds a lot of cost and it makes it more inequitable to kind of achieve the goals. Thank you. This is great brainstorming. I'm intrigued by the tracking idea. Um, yeah. And I think so, great. Let's go to our next, Item. Next item is uh, item six. This is a Commissioner Bordalazzo uh, item. Um, and the comment is approval criteria for historic designation removal review are too broad. This is moving in the other direction how things might come off or down um, in the hierarchy. Yeah, so this is related to some of the items we discussed earlier today, uh, specifically the uh, uh, removal. Uh, and it might be a little bit down in the weeds, you know, you kind of, it's, it's, you know, 33846040C, but uh, it just feels like you only need to meet one of the following approval, uh, of the criteria, uh, approval criteria uh, when you used to have to uh, meet all, and they're fairly broadly written, so loss of public benefit, change in designation and, and basically the, the comprehensive plan goals are better met by changing the level of designation or owner consent, which I think that makes a lot of sense. But, and I think the historic landmark condition also flagged this up as a, as a nation of issue of being really so broad that, um, you know, it almost comes down to trust or, you know, maybe less objective, uh, clear and objective criteria. Okay, do you have some thoughts on this one? I will confess that when I read it, and this reflects in my comment number seven, I misread it. I, I actually read all instead of one. Um, so I will share that I think, um, I guess I'm not really weighing in directly on Ben, your suggestion, but I think that number one, no one's ever gonna meet, that's an impossible hurdle to meet. Um, it doesn't mean that the other ones couldn't be met um, because it's saying that um, if you lose public benefit, which means you do not meet the applicable criteria, ap applicable criteria for historic designation review in sections 33, it references D1 and D2. Um, D1, you meet that by being a national, a national designation. In D2, um, if the property continues to be in place. So putting this down in, I think, lay terms, um, if there's a property on the national register, just the national register, and it's still in place, then you haven't met number one. So I think that I, I would probably focus, if we focus this conversation on the other items on the list, two, three, and oh, just two and three, I guess. Because I'm not sure number one gets you any, I don't think anyone can actually degrade or boot a district based on number one. I don't see it ever happen. So as staff, I'll jump in. Um, this is one where, I don't wanna say, um, we've exercised our brains to work within the constraints of the state goal five rule, to work within the national register program and to think about the hierarchy. And so the goal five rule says, 
when a resource is designated by a city, uh, when it's when it's <clears throat> has a city status, the only way it can be removed from city status is if it's effectively lost the qualities for which it was designated. It's really looking at the historic significance. It's looking at how important it is. But what goal five hasn't provided us with is consideration of uh, how we might change or amend the level of protection or what we might call the resource type, the, high, you know, the hierarchy is just a way to convey that protection. So what we have sought to do with criterion two is provide the opportunity to reevaluate what level of protection applies to a resource without necessarily completely pulling it off the list. And so this one, we're happy to talk some more about the fine points. This has been one where we've really been looking for a way to make sure we follow the goal five, the, the letter and the spirit of the goal five rule while also giving our decision makers the ability to make some um, intentional choices about how best to protect the resource and at what level. Kristen. Kristen, do you want to jump in? Well, yes, I, I would say this, um, this set of approval criteria gives the Landmarks Commission pretty great concern. And as you know, one of the deciding bodies who would be using it, um, I, I, really, um, I really struggle um, with things that are this open-ended. Um, it is really difficult to, to sort of say, oh, the goals and policies of the comprehensive plan, you know, that needs to be more tightly defined. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about the level of designation, that's when I get back to really wanting what are our goals for each level of resource to be better defined? Because then, you know, it makes our job easier. We don't get to just sort of opine about how something might be better if it were a conservation district. These are a legal nexus, you know, and this this is the really tough thing. You know, even even if these um, even if these are going on to city council, you know, city council needs approval criteria that really work as well. You know, they they need they need to base their decisions on something that is um, legally defensible. And I just fear that these are not. Um, the, the previous evaluation factors that used to be part of a, um, you know, I guess a, a demolition review were a little bit closer to what I would say being not explicitly, but based on comp plan factors. Um, and, and I guess, you know, demolition um, or, or, or removal should be similar to ap approval criteria, you know, as you said, Brandon, but, you know, flip it and unspool it, you know, those aren't applicable anymore, or this one's not met. And, and I, and I just um, think there's so much leeway of interpretation here. I'm very concerned. Thank you. Um, Jeff. Uh, I kind of share Kristen's concern with this whole section. I mean, both, I proposed some language before and realized I was confused by some language in this section. Eli, you said the same thing. I, I would suggest this entire section, 040, maybe goes to three by three. And Brandon can kind of walk us through, what are we trying to do here? Because just reading the criteria, I'm, I'm confused. I'm not sure what what we're regulating. I'm not sure how we're trying to regulate it. So maybe, particularly now in the interest of time today, maybe this is something that goes to three by three and we can dissect it a little bit more and come back to the full commission with something that's, at least we know what we're trying to achieve because I can't tell by these regulations. That sounds like you rate three by three. And I'm, I'm gonna guess, you can correct me if I'm wrong staff, that what's trying to be achieved here is so that there is some functional way to send something up or down the hierarchy. And, we don't have a way to do that right now. The state doesn't require that we come up with a way for that. But since we do have a hierarchy in this proposed um, package, um, this would provide a, some way of moving things up and down in it. And in this case, down in it. Correct. Right. Um, many... Having more clarity in this sounds great. And I actually want to ask, before we leave this one, what's the, um, can you remind me who the review, who's the review body or the review process as described in the historic designation removal review? Who, who's doing that? Yeah, good uh, question. 
Correct me if I'm wrong, Brandon, but I think there, I think our, um, I think our commission is the review body for some level and then does it go to city council for the higher level? Is that so right, Brandon? Much like with designation, it can occur quasi-judicially for an individual owner applicant. So Landmarks Commission would be the decision maker if an individual owner were seeking removal or a change. Um, but if it's a group of property owners, it would be legislative and the PSC under the proposal would be the recommending body to council. So think about it, individual owner, Landmarks Commission, collection of owners, PSC, I suspect the three by three will talk about that um, for your last for your last conversation. But that, that's what was proposed. And, and I'll just say one last thing, which is most local governments in Oregon don't have a menu. Like we have this hierarchy. Many local jurisdictions around Oregon might just have one size fits all, or maybe they only follow the goal five rule. So, you know, we have a little bit of a um, puzzle to figure out here that other communities don't because we have historically had the historic and conservation level, but we haven't had are the mechanisms to um, move things up or down. It's not unreasonable to think that some of our existing conservation districts and maybe even some of our historic districts whether they've lost buildings or there's been a high degree of alterations, whether we've learned more about their history over time and they're actually more important than we thought might be more appropriate to move up or down. So I think I look forward to the three-way three discussion just to see how we how we make sure that the moving a ladder run is done within goal five rules, but then also really does meet the, the, the best spirit of our um, you know, comp plan and how we make those decisions. Thank you, I think that helped clarify what staff's proposal is. Um, any other comments on this? Okay, well, thank you everybody. I think it's a long meeting, but we came up with some new ideas that I think no one person had come in in their head. So that's great. Um, I will ask staff to remind me when this continues so that I can continue this hearing to land. Does someone know when we bring this up again next? Or I guess the sheet says probably. January 12th. Um, it was a three by three meeting on the 17th um, where no decision will be made. We'll then continue this discussion of historic resources to January 12th. And with that, thank you everyone. Our meeting is adjourned. <laughs>